In the series premiere of Dead to Me, we're introduced to Jen. She's a recently widowed real estate agent, and she's having a tough go of it. So she decides to head to a support group for the first time. And at the support group, she's introduced to Judy, who is also there for the first time. And while Jen is reluctant to talk, Judy is wide open with her situation. Her fiancé dropped dead of a heart attack, and that's why she's there. All the talking does encourage Jen to finally open up that her husband was killed by a hit-and-run driver, and they haven't caught the guy yet. Jen and Judy also share another common struggle is the fact that they can't sleep. So after the meeting, Judy gives Jen her number and says, hey, if you can't sleep, call me. That night after Jen's two kids go to bed and she's done crying, she does in fact have trouble sleeping and she decides, ah, what the hell, I'll call Judy up. And they start talking about their husbands and their fiance and their situation and it actually does help and Jen get some sleep. And the two quickly form a friendship where they bond not only the fact they lost somebody but over stupid things like the facts of life. They start hanging out pretty regularly and it's always Judy heading to Jen's house but one night they're driving around and they stop because Jen has spotted a car that's all dented up. And she stops every single time she sees a car that could have been involved in a hit and run because the cops say most of the time you're never going to find that person. And while she doesn't think it's going to help, and she doesn't think she's going to catch the person who did it, she still does it anyway. A few days later, Jen heads over to Judy's house and calls her up and says, Hey, I'm coming over because you always come to my house, and I've never been over to yours. And this takes Judy off guard a little bit, and she says, Well, you don't know where I live. But in fact, because she's a real estate agent, Jen does know where she lives, because Judy sent her a picture of her and her fiancé at their house, and she recognized the place. But when she knocks on the door, she is shocked to find that Judy isn't there, but her alleged dead fiancé is, and he is very very much alive. Steve is standing in front of her in the flesh and she says, is Judy here? And he says, no, Judy hasn't been here in months. We broke up. And also, can you tell her to stop coming around here? I'm going to change the locks. Judy is frantically calling Jen, trying to explain herself, but Jen is sending her straight to voicemail. And while she's shocked, she's still a businesswoman, so she hands him her business card and says, well, if you don't want her to know where you live, it's a seller's market. And he actually takes her up on this. Jen doesn't answer any of Judy's calls and decides to confront her at the next meeting and rip into her about why she's even there. She tells the whole group group that Judy's dead fiance is actually alive and she's just been lying the whole time. Now the rest of the group wants to hear her side of it and she explains while she's very sorry because she's not going through what they're going through. She explains how her and Steve did break up and she has been having a tough go of it but they broke up because she was having miscarriages. They desperately wanted to have a child and after her fifth miscarriage they couldn't do it anymore. At the end of the explanation Judy apologizes and leaves and the group feels really bad everybody except Jen who doesn't buy the story. But after sleeping on it Jen feels pretty bad about it so she heads over to Judy's work where she teaches art to the elderly at an assisted living facility. She apologizes for how she acted and also says that her miscarriages aren't nothing. She did lose somebody in this situation. She also notices, though, that Judy is actually living at the assisted living facility for the time being until she can find her own place. And Jen actually has a place because the guest house where her dead husband used it as a studio is empty at the moment. So she invites Judy to live with them, and Judy graciously accepts. Judy heads over to a storage facility, though, to get some things for the move. And one of the things in that storage facility is a car that has definitely been involved in a hit and run. So in episode two, Judy has moved in and Charlie, the oldest son, is reluctant to give her a warm greeting. He's reminding his mother that we don't even know who this woman is, but he's doing it right in front of Judy. And while it's true that she doesn't really know who she is and didn't really put a timetable on how long she'll be staying there, Jen still yells at Charlie for being rude. After dinner, Jen and Judy are cleaning up the dishes and Jen comes clean that when she went over to Steve's place, she was so mad that she gave him her business card to sell the house and he's hired her to do that. But this comes as such a shock to Judy that she ends up accidentally cutting herself pretty badly because that That was the house that they were planning on starting a family with, and she thinks that she should have a say. But she gets the cut cleaned out, and then she heads over to the guest house slash music studio. And she's a little freaked out being there, being in the same place where the guy that she killed spent so much time. So much so that she has trouble sleeping. Now, it might be the fact that Steve is selling his house because the next day she heads over there, but he has changed the locks. She then heads over to his work, but he's not there, and the women there are imploring her that she has to leave. She frantically writes a note, leaves it on his desk, and heads out. Now, Steve isn't there because he's headed over to Jen's real estate agency to meet with Jen and her business partner, Christopher. And Christopher lets it slip that Judy is actually living with Jen now. And Jen admits that Judy has been a rock for her during this hard, difficult time. And Steve is a little surprised to hear this and says, really? And Jen says, yeah, why? Steve says, I don't want to talk bad about her, but it's just wherever Judy goes, chaos follows. I wish her the best, but she's kind of crazy. And that night, as she's looking outside of her kitchen... She notices that Judy's a little out there as she performs this kind of Buddhist ceremony in the guest house to rid the evil spirits away. And on top of it, the next morning she notices that Judy actually decided to sleep outside. 
So Jen decides to confront her about this. Why are you sleeping outside? Is the guest house not okay? And she says, no, the guest house is great. It's just there's a lot of Ted in there. And Ted is Jen's dead husband. You know, there's a lot of his things. And it's just really overwhelming. But the two are interrupted when there's a knock at the door. And two police officers are there to hand Judy a restraining order. She tries to immediately explain to Jen that it's not nearly as bad as it looks. She headed over to his place to talk about him selling the house. But he wasn't there. So then she headed over to his work. And then she headed off to the golf course. And instead of just talking to her, he's blowing her off and getting the cops involved. Involved. And while Jen kind of believes this story because Judy's going through a tough time, Charlie definitely does not. He is hesitant to believe anything that Judy says. So much so that when Jen leaves for work, Judy decides to kind of try to befriend Charlie, but he's very reluctant at first. He says, I don't want to talk to strangers, especially stalkers. But she chisels away at that rough facade, and after sharing a little bit of common ground with weed, where he asks, hey, do you have any? And she asks, do you? And he sadly says no, but she refuses to answer. She decides to buy the boys dinner for the night. Jen, on the other hand, had to actually go over to Steve's place because they're selling it. And as her and her business partner are checking it out, Jen opens up one room and she finds the nursery where they were going to have their kid. And Jen lets Steve know that Judy opened up about her miscarriages and Steve admits that it was really, really difficult for them. And when Jen comes home that night and finds Judy with her two kids getting along, it kind of puts her mind at ease a little bit that this woman is not crazy. The next day, to make it more cozier for her, they start taking some of Ted's things out of the guest house. Charlie asks if he can have his dad's gun that was in the safe that was in the guest house, but Jen says no. First of all, I don't know the combination, and second of all, even if I did, you're a child, you're not getting the gun, I'm the protector of the house. And Judy was a little surprised to know that there was a gun in there. But they clean all the stuff out and take it over to a storage facility that just so happens to be the same storage facility right next to Judy's storage facility where she's holding the car that killed Jen's husband. And as she's recollecting on that night, you come to find out as the viewer that Judy was driving and did in fact hit Ted, but Steve was in the passenger seat and helped her hide the vehicle. As they're driving back from the storage facility, Jen notices a car on the side of the road. And she's seen this car before because the car's almost hit her a few times and she's gotten into it with the owner. And now she's hypersensitive to hit and runs that she decides to teach this guy a lesson. She opens up the back of her car, pulls out a golf club, and just starts smashing this Corvette vet to bits. Unfortunately, she doesn't move fast enough and the guy clearly saw her license plate as she sped away. In episode 3, Jen's youngest son, Henry, is convinced that the bird that wakes him up every morning is actually Ted reincarnated. And while Jen thinks it's ridiculous, Judy thinks it's kind of sweet, until she thinks about the fact that she might be staring at the man that she killed, in the form of a bird. But Judy shakes it off and the two head to the group meeting, where the group is happy to see them both back and both friendly. And at this group meeting, Jen reveals that it's actually going to be Ted's 50th birthday tomorrow, or it would have been. The group thinks that they should still celebrate the birthday, but Jen thinks that's ridiculous. Why would I sing happy birthday to a dead person? So the leader of the group says, well, maybe you can turn this into a memorial. When my aunt died, we wrote things down that we weren't able to tell her while she was alive, wrapped it up, put it in a balloon, and let it go into the sky. But Jen isn't feeling that either. After the meeting, she heads off to Steve's place where they're having an open house, and it's going great. She's getting offers left and right for this place above market value. But the good mood goes out the window when another real estate agent named Lorna walks in. And both Jen and Christopher fight about who has to deal with her, and Jen loses out. And this woman is rude and insulting, and unfortunately for Jen, she was her mother-in-law. She was Ted's mom. And the two did not have a good relationship. She tells Jen that she's going to have a little something over at the house for Ted's 50th birthday party. But Jen says, no, no, you're not. And when Lorna wants to know why, she just blurts out, uh, because I'm having something. Yeah, we're having a memorial service. And we're going to write notes into a balloon and let it off into the sky. She's hoping that Lorna won't come, but Lorna says, all right, I'll be there. And Jen really isn't happy about that. Judy also headed off to work where she was in the middle of helping a guy with a puzzle, but Steve shows up out of nowhere. He tells her that after thinking about it, he felt bad about the restraining order and took it away and that he's working with Jen and she's actually really nice. But he had no idea that she is the wife of the guy that they hit. He plays it off like we hit a deer, but she acts like she didn't hear it. Judy tells him, I befriended her and I tried to tell you that, but you've been shutting me out. And I'm helping her and maybe we can do some good with this whole situation but steve is shocked at this line of thinking and says you actually are nuts he can't believe that after their situation judy thought it was a good idea to invite jen into both of their lives because now jen is selling steve's house and that opens up a can of worms with the house but steve quickly gets the conversation back on track and it was actually steve's plan to stay quiet about the hit and run whereas judy actually wanted to come clean he tries to explain to her that if you tell jen about this it's only going to cause her more pain but she reminds him you're not my fiance 
away, and you're also not my lawyer anymore, so I don't have to listen to you. And as soon as she leaves Steve, she gets a phone call from Jen, who needs help planning this party that she doesn't want to throw. And as Jen is lamenting the fact that she has to throw this party despite her ex-mother-in-law, Judy volunteers to do it because it's kind of her thing. So Judy takes the party planning off of Jen's hands, and now Jen just has to worry about the food. And as she's preparing it, she notices that Charlie is just fixated with this video game, and she inquires about it, and he says, well, it's a multiplayer game, so you play with a bunch of people. Actually, I used to play with Dad. His laptop's over there if you want to try it, but I don't think you'd get it. And Jen agrees, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't get it. She completely misses the fact he's trying to bond with her. But now it's time for this party that they don't want to throw, and Judy has done a phenomenal job planning this thing. Everybody thinks so, including Lorna when she shows up, but she is surprised to find Judy because she's never heard of her, and she's kind of appalled about the fact that this woman that they don't really know is living with them all of a sudden. She's also brought this very obnoxious cake of her and Ted. But they all start the memorial service, and they're writing things down that they want to say to Ted, including Judy, who writes down, I'm so sorry, it's all my fault, and puts it in a balloon. But this is really emotional for her, and she has to collect herself, so she runs to the bathroom to do so. But when she exits... There's Lorna right in her face, kind of wondering who the hell she is. But she's also slipping in insults about Jen, and Judy ain't having that. She's defending her friend. When they both come back outside, they continue the memorial service, but they're interrupted by the police, who have shown up this time for Jen. Because that car that she's always calling the cops about speeding somehow got vandalized the other night. And they think they know who did it. But Jen turns this on the cops and says, You guys are worried about some stupid car, yet there's a killer out there who murdered my husband and you guys won't find him. So why don't you get back to me when you find out who did that? Judy eventually takes the fall for Jen and says it was actually her and not Jen that vandalized the car. Jen follows her out to the cop car, but when she returns, Lorna is giving it to her about having a criminal living under her roof with her grandchildren. And Jen flips out. She says, my friend isn't a criminal, and not only that, she's been the only person there for me during this time. You know, me and Ted had a great marriage, but the only difficulty in the marriage was you. Lorna disagrees and says that's not true. She then tells her that Ted actually called her the night he was murdered and asks if Jen wants to discuss that, but Jen just wants her to leave. They do eventually release the balloons, and the mother-in-law does eventually leave. Judy, however, is arrested, and the cops don't believe her story that she was just randomly carrying around a golf club to just beat things with, but she's sticking to it, and she's admitting to a crime, so they do arrest her, and she ends up calling her lawyer, or ex-lawyer, Steve. And as they're leaving the police station, Steve tells her, whether you like this or not, we're in this thing together, so just trust me. Now, Jen is at home just reflecting on the day, and she notices that that bird that keeps waking up, Henry, has returned, and then she also notices that one of the balloons they let go is low enough that she can get. So she pops it and reads the message, and it was from Charlie saying, I wish you were still here so we could play that video game. And that's when Jen understands. So she grabs his laptop and signs on and messages Charlie, hey, I'm here to play. I'm going to try this thing out. But then she gets a message from some user named Bambi88. And it starts innocent enough like, hey, you're back. I miss you. But then it goes to, when can I see you? And then finally, I miss your cock. Episode 4 picks up the next morning where Judy thanks Steve for bailing her out by sleeping with him. And Steve has decided he wants Judy to move back in with him. He asks her, how are you supposed to move past all this when you're still living with the person's wife that you killed? But Judy says, well, we're becoming really good friends. I can't just leave her like that. But Steve tells her, if you move back in with me, I'll take the house off the market. And Judy agrees. So Judy heads over to Jen's where Jenning is spinning out her frustration over learning that her husband was cheating on her. And when Judy tells Jen, I slept with Steve last night a few times, actually, right before she can get out and I'm going to move back in with him, Jen cuts her off and says, yeah, well, Ted was fucking somebody. And Jen goes on to tell Judy how she figured it out. So Judy hops on this game and starts chatting with Bambi88 and learns that she's a waitress. They figure out what restaurant she works at, and the two head over there to confront her. And as they're sitting at the bar trying to figure out exactly who Bambi is, Bambi actually comes up to them and asks them if they want a table. And right off the bat, Jen is very, very rude to this girl. She's feeling self-conscious because this girl is probably 20 years old and a little bit hotter than her. It's not like Jen isn't hot for, you know, 40. But her stress level gets raised even more when she gets a text from Christopher saying that Steve is taking his house off the market. And considering he had five bids over asking price, this really annoys Jen. Apparently Steve told Christopher I fell in love again, and Jen thinks it's the house, but Judy says, I think he's actually talking about me. So Jen says, what, are you just going to move back in with him? And Judy says, well, I tried to tell you this morning, but... This whole Ted thing came up, and there was never really a good time to fit it into the conversation. And Jen is pissed off, not just because this is costing her the house, but also because Steve is kind of a douchebag. She reminds Judy that that house never even looked like you lived in it. I mean, he didn't let you put up anything or decorate anything. And while she's yelling at Judy, Bambi's coming up trying to take their drink orders, but Jen is continuing to be very rude to her, while Judy, on the other hand, is being very, very nice. 
But Judy tries to change the subject by saying maybe you're going to get more information out of Bambi if you're not a total bitch. Jen isn't really interested in that, however. But the next time Bambi comes over, Jen continues to be a bitch, but Judy compliments her shirt, and then they learn that she's actually a singer. And from there, Bambi lets them know that she was working with her boyfriend, Ted, and he ghosted her a few months back, but all of a sudden he just showed up again, and he's supposed to meet her after his shift. Jen asks, well, how long are you guys been dating? I mean, that is really weird behavior. And she says, ah, not too long, about a year and a half. And when Jen learns that she's been cheated on for about a year and a half, she's devastated, but she tries to turn this back to Steve. Judy says, you didn't know him like I knew him. I mean, he was good to me. He never beat me. He never cheated on me. And that's a pretty big trigger word at the moment. And Jen says, well, apparently I didn't know anybody and leaves. Judy's sitting there alone at the table and Bambi comes back and Judy asks for the check and then she says, by the way, Ted's dead. Bambi says, well, what do you mean, my Ted? And she says, no, my Ted, because he was my husband. And Bambi lets her know that Ted told her that she was dead. So Judy walks out of the restaurant kind of surprised and meets back up with Jen in the parking lot. Jen has keyed somebody's car. She assumes it's Bambi's, but she doesn't know for sure. And they're driving home and Jen is driving pretty erratically because she's kind of in that I just found out my dead husband's been cheating on me for a year and a half kind of mood. And her erratic driving is actually scaring Judy to the point where Jen finally pulls over and says, fine, you drive. But the problem with that is after her accident, Judy said she would never drive again. And when she gets behind the wheel, she's driving about 10 miles an hour. So the conversation with Steve picks up again because he's been texting Judy all night and now he wants her to come over. But Jen says, well, what do you want? So the two head over to Steve's place where Judy hides in the car, but Jen goes to confront him. She knocks on the door and says, you need to take that offer that's 200000 above listing because Judy's not coming back. I mean, it's not like you ever let her live in this house to begin with. And Steve is a little taken aback and says, well, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. I mean, you barely know her. Jen says, well, I barely know her, but I get her. So take the offer. When she gets back to the car, Judy reveals that Bambi told her that Jen was dead. And not only did Jen die in this situation, but Jen was dead from breast cancer. And this is a particularly touchy subject because Jen's mom died of breast cancer when she was 19. And since she had the gene, she had a double mastectomy because she didn't want her boys dealing with what she went through, losing their mother at a young age. So this really upsets Jen to the point where she says, you know what, I'm glad he's dead. And when Judy hears that, all of a sudden her burden is lifted and she feels like driving again. So in episode 5, Jen sends the kids to their grandmoms and Judy and Jen head off for a grief retreat. And the grief retreat is basically a bunch of chapters around the country coming over to one. So they're the Laguna chapter, but there's also a Vegas chapter and a Phoenix chapter. And they're all meeting for the weekend to try to grieve together. But Jen has no interest in grieving. She's just trying to drink her pain away at the moment. Now, while Judy's open to go into some of these seminars and trying to get something out of this, Jen isn't open to any of that. She just wants to drink. That is until she sees some hot guy. And now she's interested in drinking and banging his brains out. And when that guy makes his way over to Jen and asks, hey, are you going to this one particular seminar? She says, oh, absolutely. This is great. I'll save you a seat. So she heads in there drunk and looking to score. And to her surprise, the seminar is run by Pastor Wayne, the guy who runs her grief group in Laguna. So she starts chatting this guy up in the middle of the seminar, asking about why he's there, what's his name, all the while being pretty rude to Pastor Wayne. And when she gets out of there, she starts shit-talking Pastor Wayne, saying that, yeah, he actually runs my group, and honestly, I never get anything out of it. But unbeknownst to her, he's actually right behind her hearing all of this. So he says, hey, Jen, you know, I think you get out of it what you put into it, but yeah, what do I know? Her and this guy laugh about the fact that she was just caught, and then she invites him to go get a margarita but he says no i'm going to do yoga maybe i'll catch you later at carry on Oki. so that's what her and judy do at night judy spent the day going to a grief group about miscarriages but now she's just trying to be a good wing woman for jen she has no interest in trying to pick up a guy she just wants to go back to the room write in her journal and have some time to herself Eventually, this guy does show up, though, and Jen heads over, and they head out to the dance floor, and Jen's a really good dancer, and when she starts dancing seductively, turns the guy on pretty quick, and they head up to his room. So they leave Judy behind, and she's just sipping on her drink, but this guy gets up and starts singing karaoke for his lost friend, and he does a really good job, and he sings one of Judy's favorite songs, so she goes over and starts chatting him up, and she even admits, I wasn't planning on doing this, but you were really good, and I really like that song, and the two start flirting together. And that actually goes better than Jen and her guy, because when those two got to the room, they start hooking up but the guy wouldn't shut up about his dead wife and it completely killed the mood so when jen heads back to the room she finds it locked and judy's like yeah you know it's me and nick in here can i get the room to myself for the night so jen heads downstairs to smoke a cigarette and she runs into pastor wayne she apologizes for being a dick and just being cynical overall and he says it's fine she's not the first cynic he's dealt with she tells him how she just found out that her dead husband was cheating on her 
And he says, well, how does that make you feel? And they actually have a little bit of a breakthrough. And this is really the first time she's ever opened up in front of them. When she gets back to the room that morning, she's telling Judy that she needs to clean her act up for her kids. And she just wishes she didn't feel like this. And Judy says, you know, I hate the person that made you feel like this, which is ironic, of course, because it was actually Judy herself. And as Jen is crying on Judy's shoulder, out of the bathroom walks Nick, the one-night stand. Judy introduces the two and says, you know, Nick's actually a police detective. He's here because his partner died. And all of a sudden, Jen perks up and says, have you ever dealt with hit and runs? And he says, I have. She says, have you ever solved one? And he says, yeah, I have. And Jen and Judy have the biggest smile on their face. So in episode six, Judy and Jen meet Nick at the scene of the crime, but they're going over the fact that there were no witnesses, no cameras, no evidence whatsoever. And Jen does admit that she's been bothering the police about getting this crime solved, even with the lack of evidence. Nick says, hey, I'll head over there because maybe because I'm a police detective and I've dealt with this situation before. You know, they're more open to talk to me and not you. And then he asks, hey, who found the body? And it turns out that one of Henry's classmates actually found Ted's body. And then Nick says, how are your boys doing? And Jen says, you know, people ask that all the time and they're actually doing surprisingly well. But that's actually not the case because that day she's called by the school principal because Charlie was caught selling drugs. One of the kids we sold drugs to was high as a kite and ran a car into a greenhouse. And while because of Charlie's situation with his dad, she's not going to report it to the police, Jen is now on the hook to get that greenhouse fixed. Jen asked the principal, all right, what do we do now? Because Ted kind of was the disciplinarian. And the principal lets her know that Pastor Wayne does have a youth group for troubled teens, but she says, look, he needs to be punished. He doesn't need to be tortured. So Charlie is going to be suspended for school for two weeks, but the principal does say it would be helpful to find out where he got these pills. And to Jen's surprise, he got them from Ted's medicine cabinet. Ted was taking all of these pills, and Jen just had no idea. Now, while Jen was dealing with her mini Pablo Escobar, Nick and Judy did head over to the police station, where they weren't exactly greeted with a warm welcome. The officer in Laguna basically explains to him that we don't have any evidence and we don't need more help right now. What we need is for you to explain to her how rare it is for this crime to actually be solved, which is about an 8% chance. So when Judy heads back to the house, Jen is administering a drug test on Charlie just to make sure. And the drug test does come back negative, but she admits, I gotta find a way to punish this kid. Although her other kid seems to be doing well, Henry, and he has a school recital that day. So Jen, Judy, along with Christopher, her business partner, head on over there to watch Henry belt his heart out and he is killing it. At one point, Christopher says, you know, he really should join my church's kids choir. But Jen is not the religious type and says, absolutely not. And everything's going great until all of a sudden somebody messes up a line or a note and Henry flips out on them. In the middle of the song, he yelled, you guys mess this whole thing up and storms off, causing a pretty big scene. Jen goes to talk to the head of the choir about it and says, I'm sad to say this is not the first time. Henry has a pretty bad temper and he lashes out sometimes. And I would have called to tell you guys about this, but Ted was always my contact and you never updated the contact information when he passed away. Now, while she was talking to the teacher, Judy took it upon herself to talk to the little girl who found Ted's dead body. And this girl is a little sociopath, but she sticks to her story that there was no evidence and wasn't any other witnesses. Now, since Jen still has the issue of Charlie to deal with, she decides to get the help of Nick to send him a message. So Nick gets all dressed up, gets a cop car, comes over and starts frisking him up and tries to do a little bit of a scared straight on Charlie. And it's working. I mean, he's doing a great job and Charlie is terrified especially when Nick heads to his backpack. He starts cleaning it out, saying, what do you got, drugs in here? But then he finds a loaded handgun with the safety off. And that's when Nick says, all right, no, I'm done playing. Like, what are you doing with this? And at this point, Charlie is upset and crying and admits that he got it from his grandmother's house and he just had it for safety and protection in case anything went wrong. But this is a pretty sensitive subject to Nick because this is exactly how his partner died. A stupid kid with a loaded gun. So everybody in the room is pretty upset about it. Charlie seems legitimately remorseful, and Nick and Judy decide that they're going to have lunch tomorrow. And later that night, Jen and Judy are talking about what transpired that day, and Jen admits that she can't stand guns. And Judy reminds her that there's one in the safe right over there, but Jen says... No, that was Ted's. It was actually given to him by his mother for Christmas. But you can tell that she just is struggling with the fact that her kids weren't doing as well as she thought they were. The next day, Judy and Nick meet for lunch, and she's asking him all these questions about the case. But Nick doesn't really want to talk about the case. He just wants to spend time with Judy. And even after he says that, Judy persists with the questions about the case. Judy's trying to get to the bottom of this, saying, you know, he was taking all these pills. Is it possible that he jumped in front of the car? And Nick says, yeah, it's possible. I mean, what if this was like a suicide attempt where he lunged in front of the car? Would it be the driver's fault? Nick says, they The hit isn't the problem. That's not the crime. The run is the crime. But without a car, without evidence, without any witnesses, there is no crime. And the fact that without a car, there is no crime really sticks with Judy. Now, since Jen's kids weren't doing nearly as well as she thought, she decides to change things up a bit. She ends up taking Charlie to Pastor Wayne's class, and he is pissed off about it because it's 10 weeks, but he needs to be taught a lesson. 
She also reluctantly takes Henry over to Christopher's church, and after some begging and pleading, allows him to join the church choir. Because it's very evident that they take it way more seriously than his school's choir, and that was the crux of the issue with Henry. That night, they get a knock at the door, and it's the girl who found Ted's body. And upon further inspection, her mother finds out that she actually kept a part of the car at the scene of the crime. So she hands over this part of the car, and when she does that, Jen is thrilled, but Judy's a little nervous at this point. So she heads over to the storage locker where they were keeping the car, but when she opens it up, the car is gone. In episode 7, Jen has new evidence, and along with Nick, heads to the Laguna Beach station to give that piece of the car to the police officer. She also demands to see the file on the case, but the cop is reluctant to do so because it's not usually a good idea to hand over the file of a murder victim to their family. But Jen keeps asking for it, and finally when she gets the file and she sees Ted's dead body, She's overcome with grief and needs to leave. She runs outside to call Judy because she feels like Judy's the only person who would understand her situation right now. But Judy doesn't answer because Judy has barged into Steve's office demanding to know where the car is. And Steve told her that he would take care of it, and he has. He's hiding the car at his mother's place. And when the two head over there, Judy finds out that Steve has already started disassembling the car. He figures that if he disassembles the entire car, he can spread it around at different junkyards throughout the city, and that makes it way tougher for them to find. And with no car, no crime. But all the while, Jen is continuing to call Judy, and Judy continues to blow her off because she's terrified that the cops have already solved this crime, and Jen knows. But Steve is not worried at all and says, answer the phone, tell her I said hi. Even with Steve's urging, she doesn't answer the phone. Judy is still very much worried and demands that they get rid of the car today, so both of them start dismantling it. And as they're doing so, they start reminiscing about different trips they took. And one trip in particular comes to mind for Judy, and it's when they went to the petrified forest, and there was a sign that said, do not take these rocks. If you do, you'll have bad luck. Judy says, yeah, you know, I read something a while back about all these people that took rocks from the petrified forest and ended up mailing them back saying that they were sorry because stealing that rock ruined their lives. And Steve doesn't buy into that at all, but Judy says, well, did you do it? Did you take a rock? He looks at her like she has eight heads and says, look, I wanted to, but no, I didn't. And I don't believe that if you take a rock, that's how you get bad luck. Jen, meanwhile, who can't get a hold of Judy, is having to show a house to clients along with Christopher. And she is not in the right headspace. As the wife of the couple who's looking to buy continues to pester her about the countertops, she frantically tries to get out of the room, and she can't because the door she's trying to go through is locked. The woman says, are you all right? And Jen says, do I look all right, you vapid bitch? The wife, the husband, and Christopher are mortified, but Jen is bawling her eyes out in front of them. And after she pulls it together, the wife is pretty understanding and actually hands her a business card of a therapist that she should see. But when the couple leaves and the door closes, Christopher says, I can't do this anymore. We can sit here and act like this is a phase with you and it all started when Ted died, but it didn't. Your attitude continues to push clients away. Jen tries to remind him that, you know, her husband just died and she's had a rough couple months, but she'll get it together. And he says, look, I've thought about having this conversation with you for years. Your anger is just simply a problem. And unfortunately for Jen, this just seems like it was the last straw for Christopher. So Jen has had herself a day. She saw her husband's murder pictures, her business partner split on her, and her best friend is not getting back to her. So she heads to Judy's work, but Judy is called out sick. And of course, she's not really sick. She's disassembling the car with Steve, and the two have finished, and they celebrate by having sex again. And after the sweaty sex, and after they get the car all loaded up in this U-Haul, Steve does admit, by the way, yeah, I did steal a rock. But I'm not buying the fact that I get bad luck because I stole a rock. Although you can tell by Judy's face that she completely buys into that theory. That night, Nick stops by the house to see Judy, but of course she isn't there because she's getting rid of the car. He does see Jen, however, and brings up the fact that it was really weird in the file because it said that Ted was wearing Vans, even though he said he was going on a run. And Jen lies to him and says, yeah, you know, he never wore running shoes. He wore Vans to toughen up the bottom of his feet. But in fact, Ted had a ton of running shoes. But for whatever reason, she feels the need to lie to Nick about this. Jen kind of shoes him off, and eventually Judy does come home, and when she does, Jen lights in her. She says, I needed you today, and the last time somebody I loved didn't text me back, they were dead. And that realization hits home with Judy, and she feels really bad about it and starts apologizing immediately for it. But when they wake up the next day, all's forgiven because Jen has gotten great news. Nick found the make and model of the car, and he's going to give her a list of all the people in the area who own that particular car. And it's a pretty rare car, so there shouldn't be too many names on it. Judy's playing it off like she's thrilled, but in reality, she's nervous as hell. And she says, well, wouldn't the person have gotten rid of the car? And Jen says, yeah, I mean, maybe, but doesn't that put a giant bullseye on them? I mean, you just happen to get rid of the car? Jen goes off to take a shower, but when she does, Judy, overcome with stress, ends up throwing up in the kitchen sink. In episode 8, Jen has the list of people who own that particular car, and she's doing an investigation on her own. 
She's going to their houses and explaining to them that she's a real estate agent and the market right now is booming and would they be interested in selling their home. And that's when she starts snooping around and gets into the garage and looks at the car. The first house she goes to it isn't the guy and he had an alibi. And when she returns to the car and Judy and Nick are there waiting for her, they start going over the list and going over the people that they're going to go to next. And they notice there's a lot of businesses on this list. And one business in particular, a place called TKG Arts, gets mentioned. And Judy all of a sudden grabs the list and wants to start looking at it. And Judy isn't feeling so great. And the more and more she looks at the list, the more nervous she gets and the worse she feels. To the point where they actually have to take her home. So Jen and Nick take her home, and as Nick is tending to her, she breaks things off with Nick. She explains that she was engaged earlier, and she still has feelings for that guy, and in her heart, she just thinks that Nick deserves somebody better than her. And this completely takes Nick off guard, and he just slowly exits the room. And while Nick was tending to Judy, Jen continued to go door-to-door because Nick cross-referenced the list with DUIs, and one name in particular popped up because he had two DUIs, and he owns that car. So Jen heads over there, and as soon as he sees Jen, this guy is a little bit creepy and says, sure, I'll talk about it, and offers her a drink. She denies the drink, but when he won't let her in his garage, then she accepts the drink, and sure enough, the two end up in the garage, and she's looking at the car. But when she finds out that he's never actually driven the car, it's just a passion project, she tries to get the hell out of there, but he's kind of got her pinned in. She actually has to physically assault him, and she yells, no means no, motherfucker, and leaves. Now, at this point, Judy's feeling better, and she storms into Steve's office, because with these symptoms she's feeling... She doesn't think it's just nerves. She thinks she's pregnant. And because the only person she's been with is Steve, she's telling him that it's his. He's confused, however, because she was with somebody else. And she says, no, I never actually had sex with that guy. But Steve isn't exactly thrilled to hear this. He says, all right, call me in nine months when you actually have the baby. Or just put yourself out of your misery and take care of it now. Because we've been here and we've done that. And you're just setting yourself up for pain. The two are interrupted, however, when a girl comes in, and it becomes painfully obvious to Judy that he's seeing her when he refers to Judy as a quote-unquote client. When she leaves the room, Judy looks at Steve and he says, I mean, you were seeing somebody. By the way, what else did you want to say? You said there were things you wanted to discuss. But she's so upset about this that she just leaves. So Jen and Judy meet back at the house, and Judy explains to her how she thinks she's pregnant, but she actually hasn't taken a test. She just went straight to Steve's. And while they're waiting for the test results, she tells Jen how she broke off things with Nick and how he deserves better than her. But Judy is confident that she's pregnant. Unfortunately, when the test result comes back in, it's negative. And she's really heartbroken about this. But Jen says, well, the good news is you can drink now. So that's what the two do. The two start drinking and Jen is telling Judy about her day and her awful experience with that guy. But at one point, Judy says, look, I know you want to find this person so badly, but I really don't think it's going to make you feel better. When Judy goes back in the house, the test has changed and now it's saying it's positive and she's thrilled. But when she goes to the doctor, the doctor explains that, no, you aren't pregnant. Your estrogen levels are so low that it's impossible for you to get pregnant. If you leave a test out that long, sometimes it can result in a false positive. She asks about the symptoms she's feeling, but he says that might be early menopause. I'm really sorry. And while she's getting this horrible news, Jen is in the waiting room waiting for it, but she's also on the phone with Nick. The investigator from Laguna has told her to cease and desist from this personal investigation she's running. But that hasn't stopped Nick, and he's still going down the list, and he ends up at TKG Arts. And as he's on the phone with Jen, he sees that a lot of the art in this art store is from Judy. And at this point, Judy has come out of the doctor's office and she's really upset. So Jen says, hey, I got to go. It's an emergency. And Nick says, yes, so do I. And as Judy is crying on Jen's shoulders, Nick is just standing there shocked at what he's looking at. In episode nine, Nick heads into the gallery and starts asking things, and he finds out that they cost anywhere between $9,000 and $25,000. And Nick knows that that's vastly overpriced. Then he asks the girl about the Mustang that's often parked out front, and she says, well, I don't know, I'm new, but I'll go get my boss. And when she goes to get her boss, it's actually Steve. Nick is pretty short with him, and he doesn't even introduce himself and just wants to know about the car, but Steve says, yeah, I can't help you there. Probably belongs to one of my artists. Nick says, one of your artists, you mean Judy Hale. And Steve keeps playing dumb, and finally Nick just hands his business card over and says, well, hey, if you remember, give me a call. And now Steve knows that the detective is on his ass. Judy is still having a tough time with the whole baby situation, and Henry tries to cheer her up by making her breakfast. Jen also tries to cheer her up by mentioning that now she's a part of their family, but that actually makes her cry tears of joy. The two are interrupted, however, when Charlie says, hey, mom, I need a new laptop. And Jen says, yeah, well, money's really tight right now, and I don't know how I'm going to pay the mortgage, so your laptop issue is on the bottom of my list. And Judy says, well, if you need help paying the mortgage, I still have the debit card between the account that me and Steve shared. I can help pitch in. But Jen doesn't really want Steve paying her mortgage at the moment. Charlie interrupts by saying, well, can Steve buy me a new laptop? And then a fight breaks out between Charlie and Jen. It ends with Charlie storming out of the room and saying, you know what, I'm going to call grandma because at least she cares. But with Judy now knowing that Jen is dealing with money issues, she goes to her boss at the nursing home and asks for a raise. The boss is hesitant to give her one, 
But an old man that lives in the nursing home, a guy named Abe, who Judy is really close with, says, you know what? Give her whatever she wants. She deserves it. So Judy's boss says, all right, I'll talk to the manager. And Abe is always looking out for Judy. But just as that conversation ends, Steve shows up and lets her know that now we have a detective on our ass. Judy says, oh, yeah, that's Nick. That's the guy I was dating. No, we're fine. He's actually really sweet. He's helping Jen try to figure out who killed her husband. Steve goes, that was you. You killed her husband. She says, why don't you just confess? You clearly want to get caught. But Judy promises that she's going to fix this and call Nick. And he says, what are you going to call Nick for? He asks if you own the car. And if anybody goes down for this, it's going to be you since you were driving and I'm the only eyewitness. And from the moment it happened, Judy wanted to go back, but Steve urged her not to. And Steve told her that she needed to run. But now he's saying it's every man for himself. He leaves when he gets a phone call from Jen, which we'll get to in a second. Because Abe, Judy's friend, overheard this entire conversation and has figured out that Judy is the one who killed Jen's husband. And Judy is overstricken with grief and doesn't really know what to do, and she wants to admit that she did it. And Abe's advice is, well, the truth will set you free. Now, Jen has called Steve because she went to Lorna hat in hand looking for a job after Christopher ended their relationship. And you find out that Jen was at one time Lorna's protege until she left to go into business with Christopher. And that's really where their relationship started to fray. After the initial incident, insults back and forth jen pleads with lorna to give her a job saying don't do it for me do it for your grandchildren we need a roof over their head and lorna does agree and she also admits the night that steve died he called her but she didn't answer because she took a sleeping pill and she's always felt really really guilty about that but jen says you can't blame yourself for his death you had nothing to do with it as she's trying to calm down lorna she notices on the computer that there's a really nice property and says are you selling that she says yeah i have exclusive listing for it it's six properties it's really great for a rich bachelor you happen to know any and that's where steve comes into the mix so jen calls steve about the property and he heads over and he's looking at it and it's enticing for sure but it's a little small and she says well if you buy both units and knock out that wall you have a palace and he says okay i'll buy both units cash and cash is about eight million and that is a massive commission for jen this is just the kind of news that she needed she heads home that night with a new laptop for charlie but when she gets there she's not greeted by charlie she's greeted by lorna and lorna tells her look i just want to let you know right off the get-go i had nothing to do with this and jen is pretty confused until charlie comes down with bags because charlie has decided that he's going to move in with grandma he doesn't want to spend one more second in that house with her because charlie blames jen for his dad's death because the night that ted died jen and ted had a pretty big fight with jen screaming at ted and charlie feels like it was jen who pushed ted out the door so he leaves to live with his grandmother even though Jen is urging him not to. And before he does it, he fits in one more pot shot saying, Dad didn't want to spend one more minute with you and neither do I. And then he leaves. Now speaking of Ted and his case, Nick has pretty much figured out that it was Steve and Judy who both killed Ted. He heads to the Laguna cop and starts telling her about this, but she's not really interested in his theory because she figures that he's biased. Not only was he dating Judy, but he's on a psychiatric leave from his current detective job. So she doesn't put too much credence in it. But then after Nick leaves, Judy shows up at her desk. And Judy says I need to admit something, but she's super nervous and she's having trouble just saying it. And finally she says Steve is a money launderer. And this is not what the cop was was expecting to hear and says do you have any proof of this and she says actually yeah i do and they head to that storage unit where they were keeping the car but along with the car there are a bunch of boxes and that's steve's paper trail and the cop is pretty surprised judy lets her know you have my full cooperation and then she heads back to jen's house and she sees a very depressed jen who is putting a lot of blame on herself for ted dying she tells judy that the night that he died they got into a pretty big fight because he hadn't touched her in over a year and judy says well he was having an affair and she says no i had nothing to do with that he stopped touching me after i had my mastectomy and i thought he could get over it but he just made me feel so disgusting and he got in this big fight and I ended up punching him in the face he wasn't going for a run that night it was one in the morning he just didn't want to spend one more second with me in that house I pushed him out the door I killed him I hit him I hit him and when she keeps repeating that over and over the guilt for Judy is mounting and finally she blurts out I'm the one who hit him and Judy admits everything she admits how she hit him how they covered it up and she feels so guilty about it and the whole time Jen is just staring at her not saying a word Judy's apologizing and begging for Jen to say something and asking, what can I do? And finally, Jen says, you can go fucking die and walks in the house. So Judy leaves and goes back to the nursing home and goes to visit Abe, who is the person she's closest to at the nursing home and the person she loves the most. But unfortunately, Abe has passed away through the night. And Judy is overstricken with grief because she never got to say goodbye to Abe. And it caps off just an overall shitty day because she just lost Abe and she just lost her quote unquote family with Jen. And at that exact moment, the FBI is clearing out that storage facility. And as they're doing it, the Laguna cop notices that there's a grease stain on the floor, which gives a little credence to Nick's story. Jen, however, has entered the guest house and goes over to Ted's safe, punches in a combination, and grabs the gun. 
And in episode 10, with Judy out of her guest house, Jen clears all her stuff out of it and puts in a high-tech security system to protect her and her family. But this is a religious day for the two women. At the nursing home, they're going through a Jewish ceremony for Abe's death, and afterwards, Judy goes up to the rabbi and starts talking about the ceremony and asking some questions. She says, I think it's nice to think about Abe being in heaven with God, but in the Jewish religion, they don't believe in a heaven and hell. This surprises Judy a little bit, and the rabbi lets her know that in the Jewish religion, if you've wronged somebody in your life, it's important to make amends and compensate for it while you're on earth. Jen, meanwhile, is in her own little hell because she's watching her youngest son, Henry, go through baptism. Henry's decided he wants to be a Christian, and Lorna and Christopher, who are also there, are thrilled, and Charlie is very confused about what's going on. He asks, hey, where's Judy? And she says, Judy won't be in our lives anymore. But that's all she's saying. She won't say what happened. After the ceremony, Jen heads straight to the Laguna police officer and tells her, it was Judy who killed my husband. She admitted it to me yesterday. But the police officer is being annoyingly calm about this revelation. She lets her know that the admission alone isn't enough to arrest her. They need evidence. And also, Judy is involved in another investigation that she can't tell her about. And the more and more the cop talks, the more Jen gets pissed off. The detective says, look, take solace in the fact that you found out who did this. Isn't that what you wanted? She says, no, I wanted justice. And the cop reassures her that if she's patient, she will get justice, but patience isn't a virtue that Jen is interested in at the moment. Jen needs to head to an open house with the units that Steve bought, and she meets Lorna there, and Lorna lets her know that Steve actually pulled his offer, which Jen wasn't aware of. This is just another blow to Jen's ego as she's forced to work for her ex-mother-in-law to keep a roof over her head. As she's walking around offering sandwiches to the people at the open house, all of a sudden Judy shows up, and Jen is enraged. Judy just wants to apologize and lets Jen know that she's planning on turning herself in and asking for the max sentence. But just the fact that Judy is breathing in front of her pisses off Jen. She just can't believe that she had the audacity to show up right now. Jen lets her know that I already turned you in, but there's nothing really they can do. The two start having a fight about what Judy's even doing there and Judy's motives, and finally Jen says, Just leave me and my family alone. I have Ted's gun and I will use it. Do you understand? And Judy says, Yes, I understand, and she leaves. And she heads straight to the bank where her and Steve held that joint checking account and cleans it out. When the woman asks why she's cleaning it out, she says, I'm going away for a while. And of course, Steve is unaware this is happening, and he's also unaware of who turned him into the feds. He's getting phone calls from all the people that he launders money for and reassures them, Look, it'll all be all right. I just need to go to the bank and move some money around. But when he gets to the bank, he finds out that that joint checking account has been cleared out by Judy, and he is pissed. And right before she leaves, Judy heads to the church where Henry's having choir practice, but Christopher stops her before she can get to Henry, and she hands over a gift for him. And it has nothing to do with Judy. Christopher just doesn't like people seeing an unfinished product in the choir. And as Jen is tucking him in, Henry makes mention that Judy gave him a bird that will always be with him. And Jen says, when did you see Judy? And he says, well, today. And this really pisses off Jen, who warned her hours ago, if you come near me or my family, I will shoot you. And Jen, since she kind of just lost her best friend, has invited a neighbor over to see if she can replace Judy. But the conversations aren't exactly taking off. The two don't have a lot of chemistry. Although this woman is a security freak and starts asking about the security system that she had installed. Then she asks where she hides her gun, but Jen says, I'm not really a gun person. I don't have any guns. But when the woman gets up to leave, she pulls the gun out of her purse and says, Hey, can you teach me how to use this just in case Judy ends up coming back? After that woman leaves, Jen is in the house, but all of a sudden the alarm goes off. And she frantically runs downstairs to grab the gun, but it's not Judy, it's Charlie who came home. He tells her how grandma has a pill problem and he apologizes for leaving in the first place. And he took all of her pills and Jen confiscates the pills and says, Were you planning on selling these? And Charlie says no, but he's got a smirk on his face. He once again apologizes and tells his mom that he loves her. Now with the two kids kids in bed, Jen heads upstairs and grabs that wooden bird that Judy gave Henry and starts inspecting it and notices there's a folded up cashier's check worth $500,000 tucked into the bird. As she exits the house to get rid of it, she's shocked to find Steve lying on one of the pool chairs. And Steve's there for Judy, but Jen lets him know, I have no idea where Judy is. She doesn't live here anymore. And Judy is drinking and walking on the same road that she killed Ted on. Steve lets Jen know that Judy screwed him over and she ruined his life, and Jen says, well, what did she do, hit another person? And at this point, Steve knows that Jen knows. And through a little more conversation, Steve reveals that Judy was driving. Because Steve thinks that Jen knows everything, but Jen had no idea that Steve was even in the car. And now Jen is putting it all together. A fight breaks out between the two because Jen says, Judy wanted to stop. What did you tell her? Steve's telling her, I don't remember, but he also said earlier that it was the worst day of his life, so Jen doesn't buy the fact that you don't remember any details from the worst day of your life. 
And in reality, what Steve told her was to drive the damn car and not to go back for Ted. At this point, Jen just wants Steve to leave and asks him to do so, but he won't do it. So she pulls out the gun and points it at him and says, I'm going to need you to leave. But he's not leaving until he finds out exactly where Judy is. And at this point, Judy has arrived at the shrine for Ted on the road. And she just wants to relieve herself of that burden so badly that she walks into the road to get hit by a car. And while she almost does get hit by a car, the car stops and she gets a phone call from Jen saying, you need to come home. And when she gets home, she finds Steve's dead body floating in Jen's pool because Jen shot him. Season 2 of Dead to Me picks up the morning after the events of Season 1. And both Jen and Judy are making breakfast, but they're completely frazzled. And immediately Henry notices the pool cover is on and asks why, to which the women both say that an animal died in there, but they don't initially agree on which animal. Although they eventually settle on a very big dog. When Charlie comes down, he says, wait, I thought Judy wasn't going to be in our lives anymore. Are you guys friends again? And while Judy's saying, yeah, I hope so, Jen's saying, no, she just stopped by to get her things. But then Judy finds out that most of her things were burned because Jen was pissed. Jen then drives Judy back to the nursing home, and as she's doing shows, she's telling her, we can never talk about what happened last night. Judy is for that. She's agreeing with her. But Jen says, you have a tendency to want to tell the truth. Judy says, yeah, well, I want to tell the truth to you because you felt guilty about killing your husband when it wasn't your fault. But at the end of the day, all Jen cares about is that Judy shuts her mouth. So she drops her off at the nursing home, and Judy cleans herself up, and then she goes to her boss and asks if she can stay in Abe's old room. The issue with that is that they're at full capacity, and they have a new resident moving in so unfortunately not her boss says wait i thought you were staying with family she says yeah i was until i wasn't she says well you do have somewhere to stay right she goes oh yeah absolutely but she doesn't and she goes in the supply closet and starts bawling her eyes out and stress eating she then makes her way to abe's room before that new tenant arrives and starts snooping around around the bed spring but she gets caught by that new tenant and her daughter and the new resident's named flo and her daughter's named michelle And they think it's pretty weird that Judy was snooping around, so Flo says, keep me away from her. But after Michelle was setting up her mom's room, she found what Judy was looking for. It's a box that has weed, keys, and a hand-drawn picture of Abe that Judy drew. And you could tell the drawing and everything meant a lot to her, and she gives Michelle a hug. She then goes to grab the car that those keys belong to, and it's Abe's old vehicle. Jen, meanwhile, headed back to her place and started cleaning up the pool area. She's also decided to take down the security cameras, to which the neighbor Karen comes over and sees. Initially, Karen asks if she wants to have wine with her later because Karen's husband's out of town, but Jen has no interest in that whatsoever. Then Karen says, wait, didn't you just get these cameras? Yeah, I'm not surprised you're taking them down. I like my security cameras a lot better. They can see the whole neighborhood. And when Jen hears that, all of a sudden she's got a hankering for wine at 11.30 in the morning. So Karen brings over the wine, and they start looking over at how strong her security cameras are, but in reality, Jen's just looking at the previous night. She's seeing on the camera that, sure enough, there's Steve showing up, and there's Judy running out to his car and asks Karen, how often do you delete this? She goes, I never do. I just keep it on the cloud. And as she's watching the footage, all of a sudden, Karen gets up because she hears something in the pool area and starts lifting the cover up. Jen frantically is screaming, what the hell are you doing? But it's too late. The cover's coming off. But when it does... Steve's body is nowhere to be found. And the thing that was making that noise is the wooden bird that Judy got for Henry. Later that day, she takes Charlie out for a driving lesson because he's been bugging her about it. But he's pretty good, and she wants to know why he's this good at driving. And he says, well, I was going on lessons with Dad. He didn't tell you because he didn't want you to freak out. But as they're driving, they almost get hit by a driver. And it was his fault, not Charlie's. And when that happens, Jen freaks the hell out. But in reality, it's just the stress getting to her. That night while on the computer, she's looking at putting in a request to get a stop sign at that intersection, but she ends up at the ADT website looking at the security footage from her house the previous night. She doesn't get long into the footage because Henry's woken up with a nightmare. After she settles down Henry, she has a nice cry and heads down to the kitchen where she's pouring herself a glass of wine, but notices that Judy left one of her bracelets there. And Judy tried to get into the art gallery to no avail, and she's been receiving phone calls all day from an unknown caller, but not answering it. And with nowhere else to go, she's sleeping in Abe's car in her dentist's parking lot when she gets a phone call from Jen. And Jen tells her, if I didn't know any better, I'd assume that you were just leaving stuff here so you could see me again. Judy says, well, is is it working? And yeah, it is, because Jen's not going to let her sleep in her car and invites her over to watch the facts of life. But they start having a cry about what happened the previous night, and then it leads into Steve for Judy. And even though Judy knows it's ridiculous because they weren't dating, she's still broken up about it. And that's when Jen gets a flashback of what really happened the previous night. Steve came over, and she did pull a gun on him. But as Steve goes to leave, he starts insulting Jen, saying, I see why Judy took pity on you. You have a dead husband who was cheating on you. He seemed miserable, by the way. And when he says that, she takes that wooden bird and starts smashing him in the head. So Jen actually didn't shoot Steve at all. But with Judy crying in her arms, she can't bring herself to tell her the truth because she's perpetuated this lie that Steve came at her and started choking her and it was self-defense when it wasn't. 
The next morning, Jen asks Judy if she wants to stay there because, once again, she has no place to go. And when the kids come down, Charlie notices that they're back to being friends again, but also says the girl named Parker should be driving them to school, which immediately Judy starts joking with Jen that the two are doing it. But then there's a knock at the door. And when the women go to answer it, to their utter surprise, there is Steve standing there in the flesh, not dead. But in episode two, you learn it's not Steve. It's Steve's semi-twin brother, Ben. And he's basically the exact opposite of Steve. He's a non-douchebag chiropractor who's a divorcee with a teenager. And overall seems like a really nice guy, but his arrival has freaked Jen out to the point where she actually faints. Don't worry, Jen, I was fooled too. And he's shown up at Jen's place because Steve is missing, and every night he calls his mom, but he hasn't called in a while. And on top of it, the FBI came around looking for Steve. So he wants to know if Judy has seen him, but she says no. Ben then gets a text that Steve's office is being raided by the FBI and heads out. And when Jen gets Judy alone, she lashes out at her for not telling her that Steve had a twin brother. But she's also very concerned about the FBI, and Judy admits that it's probably her doing because she turned Steve in for money laundering. And Jen is really pissed off at that, but what was she supposed to do because they were fighting at the time? And the reason Jen is so freaked out is because the FBI is really good at connecting dots, and they are the dots. Jen gets really nasty and says, you know what, Steve was right. Everywhere you go, chaos follows. She asks, what's going to happen to me if I get caught to my boys? They'll be orphans. But since Judy is working with the FBI, she vows that that won't happen, and she can talk to the FBI and fix this whole thing and steer them in another direction. Jen says, I'm not going to let you take care of my boys. You were living in your car yesterday. You have some of the worst judgment of anybody I've ever seen. Jen tells her, do not steer the FBI in any direction, just stay out of it. But Judy can't stay out of it. She heads to Steve's office along with Ben and starts planning a story that Steve went off to Mexico because he said previously that if he was ever in trouble, that's where he would go. And it's a pretty believable story. And when Ben and Judy get to Steve's office, it's been completely raided by the FBI, torn apart. And Ben can't figure out what kind of mess Steve was in. And Judy says, I know it has something to do with the art gallery because it was a front. Ben starts shaking his head and says, you know what? I'm glad you guys broke up because Steve doesn't deserve you. And that's when Judy admits that she's the one who turned him into the FBI for money laundering. She starts apologizing, but Ben says, don't apologize. You did the right thing. He brought this all on himself. Then while looking through his office, Judy finds the rock that Steve took from the petrified forest. And Ben says, I thought you weren't supposed to take rocks from there. And she says, yeah, there's multiple signs about that. But Steve's going to Steve, and Judy decides to keep the rock. And while they were going through Steve's office, Jen headed to work and started looking at who was going to take care of her kids if she was caught. And there's really only one option for her. It's Lorna. So she asks Lorna if she will take care of the boys, and of course she says yes. But immediately Lorna thinks she's sick, and she says, I'm not sick. She says, well, how are you sleeping? Jen says, I mean, it could be better. So Lorna pulls out some pills and says, here, take two. But the pills are fentanyl, and Lorna can't even remember where she got them. Jen grabs the pills and then heads over to the Holy Harmonies concert where she's approached by a mother repping the Harmommies. And she's asking Jen to sign up for an event to help out, and Jen keeps saying, oh, I'm busy this day, I'm busy that day. And when she keeps pressing for it, Jen really snaps at her. She then asks Christopher if his brother is still a lawyer because she needs to redo her will, but he's actually a criminal defense attorney, and she says, yeah, I'll take the number anyway. When her, Henry, and Charlie get home that day, Detective Perez is there at their doorstep, and Jen sends the kids in, and Detective Perez is there because she's giving her the restraining order against Judy Hale, but as she's doing so, Judy comes out of the house, and Detective Perez is like, you've got to be kidding me. Jen plays it off like she needed a restraining order because it was a misunderstanding, but Detective Perez is not buying it. She says, it's a misunderstanding like she didn't hit your husband. You were in my office two days ago saying that I should arrest her, and if I had the evidence, I would have. But the girls tell Detective Perez that it wasn't Judy at all. It was actually Steve, because Steve was driving and it was his car. And Judy was just taking the fall. Judy then goes inside, and Detective Perez warns Jen that Steve was mixed up with some really bad people. And if Steve was mixed up with the bad people, then Judy might also be mixed up with them and she should probably stay away from her. And that night, Detective Perez heads over to Nick's place, admitting that, you were right, Judy and Steve were the ones behind Jen's husband's death, but I could use some help on this. But he's not willing to do that because he doesn't want to work with the racist police chief in Laguna. It probably doesn't help, too, that he's a little tipsy, but he does go inside and grabs a folder and says, here, I did some digging, this might help, and then closes the door on her. Now, after that visit from Detective Perez and what she told Jen, Jen is a little freaked out. She wants to know exactly who these bad people are that Steve was in business with, And Judy says, it was the Greek Mafia. But this actually could work to their benefit because the FBI is only worried about his business and they'll probably figure that the Greek Mafia took Steve out. And Judy's whole contention is that nobody knows where Steve is, so as long as everybody thinks that he is safe and running, 
then they're safe. But none of this is doing anything to qualm Jen's nerves. The group heads in to have dinner that night, but there's a knock at the door, and it's Ben returning a painting that Judy made for his parents. Judy then invites Ben in to have some dessert, and as he's eating it and Judy is getting him tea, Ben says, you know, Judy was probably right. He is down in Mexico. And this is the first time that Jen is hearing about this story. Ben then says, you know, Steve, everywhere he goes, chaos follows. But then they hear a scream from their garage because Henry went looking for the dad bird that hasn't shown up in a few days and he's found him and he's in trouble. The bird is flying around the garage and he wants to help him out. So Judy grabs the bird and takes him outside, but the bird doesn't fly away. It actually stays. And that night after everyone's left, Jen hears a little tapping going on in the garage and she goes to investigate and sees the bird is tapping on the window from outside. And the reason the bird's tapping on the window from outside is because dad bird is actually bird mom and she has a nest full of baby birds in the garage. So Jen takes the nest outside so the mom can be reunited with her kids. But then she sees the pool and gets a flashback of what happened the previous night. And more specifically, what they actually did with the body. Because Steve's body is sitting in the freezer in the garage. So Jen has a freezer with a steve sickle in it. And that night as she heads downstairs to grab Charlie some more water, she hears a noise from the garage and heads in to find Judy sitting there listening to whale sounds, trying to sleep next to the freezer. Judy just doesn't think it's right that Steve is in there all alone. But Jen says, you can't be sitting out here like this. What happens if the boys come out what are you going to tell them but judy is buying into all these signs that she's seeing that are telling her that steve shouldn't be in that freezer at all and one of those signs is that the lights keep flickering on and as the women are leaving it happens so jen decides just to change the bulbs she's not buying that it's some paranormal sign but as they leave again the light flickers again and now they're both a little freaked out they want to know what exactly is tripping the sensor. So they grab a broom and start banging on the freezer, and then all of a sudden, tons of rats scurry from under it. They call an exterminator, and he goes through the whole protocol of what he'll do to get rid of the rats. And then they ask, why were there so many of them? He says, well, they have trouble controlling their body temperature, so when they find a cool place, they hang out there. And if there's meat in that freezer, they can smell blood from like a mile away. Judy then asks if they can get into the freezer and says, oh yeah, they can chew into that freezer. And to Judy, this is a sign that they have to move Steve out of that freezer, but Jen doesn't want to do that. She wants to keep Steve in there for the next seven years until the kids go off to college so if she does get caught they'll be okay but seven years is a long time and they need to figure out how to get rid of a body without going on google and doing some research that the fbi can track jen suggests wheeling him out in a suitcase but judy doesn't want to put the man that she was going to marry in a suitcase judy suggests renting a boat and dumping him out in the ocean but jen doesn't like that idea at all and says let's think back to the suitcase and judy goes no we can't do that he was a person with a soul and Jen reminds her that he might have been a person, but he was a terrible person. He left Ted to die. He left Judy after all the miscarriages. He was kind of a piece of shit. Why are you defending him? And Judy's defending him because she feels like it's her fault that Steve is dead. Because she brought Steve into Jen's life, and she never expected Steve to lash out and actually attack Jen. Although, that never actually happened. Jen tries to make her feel better by telling her, it's not your fault. Judy heads off to work and overhears Flo telling Melissa that she wants to leave and she hates it there at the nursing home. So Judy pops in trying to help the situation, telling her that she hosts an art class every Tuesday and Thursday, and maybe she would like that. But when Flo starts criticizing the art in her room, Judy takes the art out, saying, yeah, no, this, this art sucks, you have a good eye. And as she's leaving, Melissa comes out and thanks her for trying to settle down the situation. Judy tells her that a lot of people hate it there at first, but then they end up growing and actually love it. She asks Melissa if there's anything she can get her to help with the situation, and after a few suggestions, she settles on weed. The two go out to smoke in Abe's car, and she tells Judy that she's moving her mom in there after a year of living with her and it just didn't go right at all and after her mom broke her hip she just felt like she couldn't take care of her anymore so she moved her in here and she feels guilty about it ever since michelle's dad died flo has just been miserable it's as if she feels guilty about being happy and judy says i get that but michelle says i don't life goes on we all die the world keeps going and other people need you and this is a breakthrough for judy who is now realizing that just because steve is gone doesn't mean she has to be miserable jen meanwhile has had a really bad day at work a couple they were selling a house to has tried to pull out of escrow and she's getting shit from Lorna about it. She's also dealing with this Edgar Allan Poe telltale heart situation where she's hearing the humming of the freezer from the garage everywhere she goes as she's trying to get work done. So she types in how to get rid of and then it auto puts in a dead body and she frantically starts to delete it but then Shandy, the little girl who found Ted's body, shows up out of nowhere saying why are you trying to get rid of a dead body? Jen goes on to explain that she's not, it was just automatically put in there and Shandy, being a little psychopath says that she would take it to this local forest because that's where all the gangs drop their dead bodies and apparently Apparently, there's more dead bodies there than trees. Jen, being horrified, says, how do you even know that? She says, oh, the dark web. It's an absolutely great research tool. And then Jen wants to know why Shandy's even there, and she's having a play date with Henry. Later that day, she goes in the garage and opens up the freezer, and this is the first time she's looking at Steve's body in there. 
But as she's doing so, Henry and Shandy come in, and Jen frantically closes the freezer door and says, you guys got to get out of here. But the more they ask questions about what she's doing and this and that, it's stressing Jen out more and more and more until finally she freaks out and says, you guys got to get the fuck out of here. And it really scares Shandy and Henry. And immediately, Jen knows she messed up, and she starts apologizing and asking what they needed, but they just slowly back out of the garage. And when they do so, Jen has a breakdown about what she just did, yelling at her kid about something that really wasn't his fault. She's just so stressed out. She then goes to a department store and grabs a bunch of chemicals that will, quote, dissolve anything. She heads home and fills up her bathtub with it, but instead of dropping Steve's body into it, she drops a dead rat into it. And as she's seeing the rat dissolve, she's just overcome and leaves the bathroom. But when she does so, she runs into Judy, who wants to know what she's doing. And when Judy finds out, she freaks out and says, I need to see Steve right now, because she thinks that it's Steve's body in that bathtub, when in reality it's a rat. And even though Jen is trying to talk her down, she's still demanding to see Steve's body. But Jen says, you definitely do not want to see Steve right now. Judy tells her, look, I'll do anything you want, but I'm not doing that. And after seeing what happened to the rat, Jen doesn't want to do it either. But she doesn't really know what to do. She's not good at this whole pretending to be okay thing like Judy was. And Judy says, I wasn't okay with that. Just because I was living here, I was miserable. It got to the point where I had to tell you what happened. And guilt starts to get to Jen, and right as she's about to tell Judy exactly what happened that night, the entire town is hit with a rolling blackout. And you can't exactly have a decomposing body in a freezer that isn't on. So Jen says, you know what, I have an idea. And the two get in the car and head to that forest that Shandy mentioned. And as they're doing so, Judy says, wait, didn't you have something to tell me before the power went out? But instead of actually telling her the truth, Jen just says, oh, yeah, that's right, Um, I forgive you. And they head on into the forest. In episode four, Judy and Jen are driving back from burying Steve's body. And I said it was a local forest, and I meant local in terms of, like, it's in the same state. It's quite a drive. And as they're traveling back, Jen starts panicking because she thinks she left the phone in the forest, but it's just in her pocket. But because she's holding the phone while driving, they get pulled over by the police. And the police officer has a very weird demeanor because he starts off the conversation with, was it worth it? You committed a crime, which puts the fear of God into the women. But he says, when you picked up that phone while driving, you committed a crime. So they're very grateful just to get out of this with a ticket. But Jen definitely is worried that now there's a record of their whereabouts. They stop off at a diner where Jen is kind of apologizing, but more so explaining why they couldn't just sit there and have a ceremony for Steve. And they had to get into that forest, bury him and get out as quickly as possible, even though Judy really wanted to do something for him. They then stop off at a hotel to get some sleep, and as they're heading to the room, they run into Karen's husband. Now, Karen's husband is always out of town and is shocked to see Jen and claims that he's there for business, but then his gay lover shows up, and it becomes very obvious to everybody involved what is actually going on. He tries to explain himself while Jen is saying, don't worry, I'm not going to tell anybody. And she and Judy head up to the room. When she gets up to the room, she calls Charlie to check in. She told the kids that they were going out of town to visit with Judy's sick aunt. And she's left Christopher in charge. And it's Christopher, Shandy, and Henry. And it is driving Charlie absolutely insane. He also feels like this is a good opportunity to ask once again for a car. But that's not exactly high on Jen's priority list at the moment. Once Jen gets off the phone, she notices that Judy is kind of visibly shaken. She tries to explain to Judy while the other night was difficult, she feels like they're finally over the hurdle of that. But Judy isn't saying a word. She's literally just zoned out staring off into space. Jen asks, are you mad at me? Because it'd be completely normal if you were, but Judy isn't mad at her. And it's freaking Jen out because usually Jen is the negative one while Judy is the positive one, and she doesn't really know how to act in this situation. Judy just doesn't feel like talking at the moment and wants to go to sleep. And at night, Jen wakes her up and suggests that they go down to the hotel bar and have a toast for Steve, and Judy really likes that idea. So they get all dressed up and head down to the bar and find out if you're there for the wedding that's in town that weekend, then it's an open bar. So, of course, they say, yeah, no, we're, we're here for the wedding. The bride's my cousin. They order drinks and try to do a makeshift eulogy, but it's kind of awkward because this isn't exactly how Judy planned this thing out. Judy ends up crying, saying he's the first person that ever made me feel loved. She also tells her that the morning after they hit Ted, she woke up and started looking for Steve and finally found him at the beach, and he was bawling his eyes out. It's not like he didn't care about what he did. He was gutted by it. He just decided to hold in those emotions for a lot of people. And that's why she wanted to take him to the beach, because he was comfortable there. She didn't want to just dump him off into a forest. Judy is really breaking down, and she regrets never getting to say goodbye to Steve. And at this point, the guilt is also getting to Jen, who is also crying, and she says, you deserve to say goodbye to Steve. And in all honesty, this is why Steve loved you, because you're the kindest person in the whole world, and I love you so much. And as the two women are crying their eyes out, some dude from the wedding shows up and asks if they want to dance, to which Jen goes, dude, read the room. Does it look like we want to dance right now? And after he slowly leaves, they laugh it off, but then they decide, no, actually, no, we do want to dance. They end up salvaging the night and getting really drunk and having a lot of fun. And at one point, even give a toast to Karen, who has no idea that her husband is cheating on her with another man. But when they try to order more drinks, the bartender says, yeah, you guys owe me 83 bucks. I know you're not with the wedding party. Because the guy that asked them to dance who they freaked out on 
Yeah, he told on them. And snitches get stitches where Jen Harding comes from. The next morning, Jen is awoken to a phone call from Christopher who lets him know that Dad Bird has been killed. And when she gets home, Henry is just distraught, and they're trying to figure out what happened. And the only logical conclusion is that Christopher's dog Adele killed the bird. Shandy even speaks up and says it was probably just animal instinct. But none of this is helping Henry at the moment. And just like Judy, Henry just wanted to say goodbye. So they have a little makeshift funeral in the backyard for Mom Bird, Dad Bird, whatever you want to call it, the bird. But that night, Jen gets a knock at the door, and it's Shandy and her mom. And Shandy comes clean that it was actually her and not Adele who killed the bird. And in more proof that she's a little psychopath, it was definitely intentional. But as she's leaving, Shandy says, I really don't want to tell Henry because he's my best friend. And Jen tells her, you know, sometimes people need a friend more than they need the truth. You don't have to tell Henry. Judy that night packages the rock that was taken from the Forbidden Forest and sends it back with a note that's apologizing for taking it. Henry goes outside and says goodnight to the bird, but as he's doing so, finds that wooden bird that was used to kill Steve. And Charlie, who's in desperate need of transportation and was told by Jen that he's going to get his father's bike once she musters the energy to get over to the storage unit and get it, has made his way over to that storage unit. But when he opens it up, there's not a bike there. There's Steve's car. In episode five, the exterminator shows up and takes out all of the traps and compliments Jen on her freezer. And Jen says, you know what? Take it. You can have it. Because both Jen and Judy feel way better having that freezer just out of the house. They then go food shopping where Judy makes mention that ever since sending that rock back, she feels like there's a lot of positive energy. And maybe Jen should have sent a rock back too because when they get to the checkout line, all of her cards have been declined. And she makes a scene, but it doesn't change the fact that she's broke. And when she gets home, she looks at the bills and realizes just how broke she actually is. I mean, she's drowning in debt and because of the financial burden the stress is just getting to jen and she asked judy very nicely to give her some space at this time so judy heads to the art gallery but she finds out that it's been cleared out and they're going to put an arby's in there she then meets up with ben for lunch and asks hey do you know where my paintings are because i really want to sell them but he has no idea he does tell her however that she is right steve is probably in mexico because the fbi has record of him crossing the border at one point and they're actually after a really bigger fish so if they find steve they can probably cut a plea deal with the FBI. And while Ben thinks that's great, Judy, on the other hand, who actually knows what happened to Steve, is stressed out about learning this information. Ben starts pressuring Judy about, if you know where he is, just tell me. And the pressure gets to Judy, who cracks and says, all I know is he was really stressed, he bought a condo and backed out at the last second and actually really screwed Jen over. And Ben says, wait, you're Jen? As in Jen saw him a few days ago? But Judy tries to walk back the comments. She then heads to the bathroom and just starts beating herself up over letting this info slip. And as she's doing so, Michelle walks in because Judy didn't lock the door. And Judy says, yeah, I'm just having a day. And Michelle is also having a day, so they decide to go out drinking afterwards. Jen, meanwhile, is trying to figure out how to scale back and save her finances and asks Lorna, hey, how much do you think I can get for my house? But she finds out that Lorna's name is actually on the house. And Lorna is unwilling to let Jen sell it because that's the only house that the boys have known and they have a lot of memories of their dad in that house. Lorna goes on to say that you don't have a financial problem, you have a personality problem. Because your personality is off-putting and it hurts your sales. She brings up an example of a couple who was going to back out of a house because of a mold issue until Lorna had to step in and, quote, show them a little love, to which Jen wasn't willing to do. And the criticism by Jen from her ex-mother-in-law annoys her, but she still has to figure out how exactly she's going to scale back. So she calls up ADT to figure out if they can lower the rate, but they can't because she signed a contract. And she's interrupted by Ben who just stops in and says, hey, I just had lunch with Judy, and she mentioned that you were going to sell Steve a condo, but he backed out and screwed you over. Jen downplays it by saying, look, deals fall through all the time. There's no hard feelings. But I definitely wasn't the last person to see him. I mean, he has all these associates. Also, do you do short-term leases? Because right now I'm living with my mother and she's driving me nuts. So Jen goes to bend over and grab the folder of short-term leases, but her back is really jacked up. And since Ben is a chiropractor, he asks if she needs some help with it, but she says, no, 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 I'm fine, it's nothing. But she ends up throwing her back out and needs help getting home, and Ben drives her home and sets her up, all the while saying, if you need an adjustment, I'll give you one, but she's saying, no, 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 I'm fine. Then there's a knock at the door, and it's Karen with more of that orange wine. Immediately, she thinks she knows Ben and recognizes him, but Ben's never met her. She then asks Jen if she wants to have some orange wine with her because her husband is once again out of town. But Jen says, this isn't a really good time. I threw my back out, and that's my chiropractor. But after Jen told Karen that her and Steve fighting was actually really raucous sex, Karen isn't buying the fact that he's her chiropractor. She thinks that the two are having sex. And that's when she says, wait, I do know you. I saw you on my security camera footage. You were here the other night. And Jen stares Karen down and says, no, you didn't. Shut up. You're drunk. You don't know what you're talking about. It gets pretty awkward where Ben just goes, I'm going to go out and get some ice for your back. And Karen starts apologizing, saying how she's just so lonely that her husband's constantly out of town. And she apologizes for misinterpreting the situation. But that interaction definitely piqued Ben's curiosity. And when he gets back, Karen is gone. But he gives Jen the ice and says, what was that all about? She thought that she knew me. 
And she says, no, 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 it was somebody else. And he awkwardly kind of tries to flirt with her, but it just doesn't go that great. But Jen's back is really messed up, and she finally accepts the offer of an adjustment. But as Ben is giving her the adjustment, she's getting freaked out looking at the face of a man that she killed the previous night because Ben and Steve are twins. And while the adjustment helps, she starts crying her eyes out because of it. She apologized to Ben later, and he reveals to her that he had seven heart surgeries, and she reveals to him that the back pain probably came from her career of dancing. To which, surprisingly, he was also a dancer for a while. And he starts dancing, but not not good. He then notices, though, Jen's sign to get a stop sign at that intersection that Charlie almost got hit at. And she says, yeah, I've become one of those mothers that I absolutely can't stand. And he says, what, a mother who cares? He goes on to explain that his own mother won't even leave the house because she's so worried that if she does, that Steve will pop up and she won't be there. He also explains that he hasn't talked to Steve in over a year because of his drinking issue. And by he, I mean Ben's drinking issue. He thought eventually they would make amends and he's regretting the fact that he might never be able to. But then she gets a phone call from Charlie, who found Steve's car and has been gallivanting all through Laguna with his girlfriend Parker. Charlie thought that his mother was hiding it for his birthday present when, in fact, she wasn't. And after almost getting caught by the cops making out with Parker in a parking lot, he is now run out of gas and needs a pickup. So Jen calls Judy, who went out to eat with Melissa at the restaurant that Melissa cooks at. And it's worth mentioning that Judy is not picking up on the flirtatious vibes that Michelle is giving off. But when she gets the phone call, Judy immediately leaves to meet Jen at the location of the car. As soon as Jen gets there, she lights into Charlie, saying that that's not your car, you shouldn't have taken it, it's not your birthday present, Judy will take you and Parker home. But instead of filling up the car with gas, she douses the gasoline all over the car and lights it on fire. In episode 6, both Jen and Judy are interrogating Charlie about where he was with that car, and they find out that he was just fooling around with his girlfriend in the car, although they don't know if they were just making out, having sex, whatever. So Jen punishes him by grabbing his cell phone, grabbing his video games, taking the door off of his room, and now she's going to drag him everywhere she goes. And while Jen goes through Charlie's phone, she sees that Parker tagged Charlie in a bunch of Instagram posts. And that's a problem because you see the car and you see a TKG hat in the photo. So Charlie, Jen, and Judy head over to Parker's house and Jen tries to nicely talk to Parker about taking the post down. The problem is Parker is a micro-influencer on Instagram and she just can't take that photo down. She needs a reason to i.e. she needs money. So Jen pays her off with money she doesn't really have, and Parker agrees to take the photo down. And when Jen gets back in the car, Judy gets a phone call from the Laguna police. Detective Perez has called Judy in because she's obtained Steve's phone records, and he called Judy eight times the night he disappeared and wants to know what he was calling about. But Judy says, I just sent him straight to voicemail. And Detective Perez pressures her to listen to those voicemails, but they're not pretty. It involves Steve calling Judy a bitch, Steve yelling at Judy. There's even a death threat in there. It's a very hostile messages. To the point where Detective Perez says, are you scared for your life? And Judy says, no, I'm fine. But it's definitely upsetting to hear for her. Jen, meanwhile, has dragged Charlie to one of her listings to show Ben. And while it really doesn't fit Ben's scene, he agrees to take it because he just wants to get out of his mother's house so badly. He says how it's nothing but Steve, 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 and they're even thinking about offering up a reward. And when he says that, it piques Charlie's interest, who says, what reward? But Jen just starts yelling at Charlie to just shut up and mind his own business. Ben then gets interrupted by a phone call, and Jen heads downstairs outside to find Charlie smoking and just acting out. She tells him that you're a child, and you should just enjoy being a child, because when you get over here, when you get to the adult side, it's not that much fun. Jen then gets a phone call from Judy who says the good news is they haven't found the car, but she has to hang up on Judy because Ben has shown up back in the room after his phone call and he's visibly shaken. Because the police have found remains and he needs to go down to the Laguna Police Department to figure out if it's his brothers or not. So Jen goes down with Ben to the Laguna Police Department, but they find out that the remains are not of Steve's, they're actually female. And Detective Perez immediately wants to know, how do you two know each other? And they explain that Jen is trying to find Ben a house. When they get back in the car, Ben is kind of overcome with grief because he's accepted the fact that that was going to be Steve, and it wasn't. He also thanks Jen for being a very kind realtor and offers to buy her a drink that night. But she says, no, I can't. I've got to go see this Christian children's choir where my son is having his first solo. And in a not-so-surprising twist, Ben is very familiar with the Holy Harmonies because from 86 to 89, he was one of them. And he kind of self-invites himself to the show. Now, Judy is also planning to go to that show, but before so, she gets tacos with Michelle, and Michelle is once again putting out heavy, heavy feelers. But while getting tacos, they run into Nick, who is not doing well post-breakup with Judy. When Judy asks him how he's doing, he says, well, I got out of the house today, so I guess that's a good thing. And this is the first time that Michelle is finding out that Judy is actually straight. She tells Michelle about the love triangle between her, Steve, and Nick, and how she broke up with Nick because she thought she was pregnant with Steve's child, but in fact, she wasn't. And Michelle says, yeah, I wanted to have kids, but my ex didn't want to either. And in fact, I'm actually still living with her. I know it's awkward, but I can't just leave her because at this point we're kind of like family. So now it's all out in the open that Melissa is a lesbian and Judy is straight-ish. But she then invites Melissa to go to the Holy Harmonies concert and they agree. But while they're watching the show... 
Christopher comes and takes Jen to the side and says, Henry's having a problem because Henry doesn't want to go on for his solo. Christopher thinks it's because his dog killed his pet bird, but Jen tells him Adele didn't do that. It was Shandy. And that's a big relief to Christopher. And it's also a relief to Christopher that Henry doesn't want to do the solo because his falsetto just isn't up to par yet. So while Henry thinks that he's going to disappoint his mom if he doesn't do it, Jen says, all right, well, Henry, what do you want to do? And Henry wants to go to the arcade. So that's where everybody heads, and they all blow off some steam and have a lot of fun. While they're at the arcade, Jen notices how Ben is interacting with her kids, and they're very comfortable with him. She then goes to Charlie and says, I'm going to put your door back on your room, but just don't have sex. It's the very awkward single mother-son sex conversation that I, I know all too well. Shout out to my mom. Later on, Jen catches Ben staring at her, and she says, what? He says, oh, I just remembered. I got to give you the check for the down payment. She says, I can't let you have that place. I'm not going to make you pay that much money for a beachfront property when you don't even like the beach. You should like the view that you're looking at. And he does because he's looking at Jen. But those are the only sparks that are flying because Michelle and Judy have made it into a photo booth. And after taking some normal photos, the two just start making out like crazy. This leads back to Michelle's place, which leads to Michelle's bedroom where they close the door. And shortly after that, Detective Perez, who it turns out is Michelle's ex, returns home. But unfortunately for Judy and Jen, Judy's handiwork the previous night by lighting Steve's car on fire has been found. Of all people, by Nick, who has gone back to the police force. And he's staring at the charred remains of Steve's car. Just before Judy makes the walk of shame, she decides to make coffee in Melissa's house. But she's caught by Detective Perez. And Detective Perez is absolutely floored that she's looking at Judy Hale in her kitchen. And she's even more floored when she finds out why Judy Hale is there and tells her, get out of my house. So Judy heads home where Jen has spent the morning clocking speeding cars with Charlie at that intersection she wants to get a stop sign at. And in a way, Charlie kind of gives his blessing for Jen to date Ben. So when Judy gets home, she immediately starts bragging about how great her night was, but it's interrupted by a knock at the door, and it's Ben to see more rental properties. And Judy tells Jen, that's why you look so good today. But Jen says, I'm not dressed up for him. But when she opens the door, Ben is visibly frazzled by something. And it's because they found Steve's car. Thanks to the VIN number, they were able to identify it as Steve's car. And the women are obviously freaked out. But because of it, Ben is really in no mood to start looking at rental properties, and he has to cancel on Jen. On top of all of that, he's supposed to plan this prayer vigil for Steve, although he has no idea what to do. And after it becomes painfully obvious of that, Jen steps in and says, just let me and Judy do it. Maybe it was guilt, maybe because she felt bad, maybe because she likes him, but Jen has now agreed to plan the prayer vigil for the guy that she killed. And of all people, Judy doesn't think this is a good idea, but Jen says, I know how it looks, but in all reality, this might be the best thing for us, because no one's going to suspect that the two people that plan the prayer vigil are actually the reason why they're having a prayer vigil. And Judy feels like this is the best time to tell Jen that Michelle's ex-girlfriend slash roommate is Detective Perez. And as soon as Jen hears that, she says, you have to end the relationship. I mean, Detective Perez hates you. But Judy doesn't want to end the relationship with Michelle because Michelle is the first person since Steve that makes her feel worthy. But Jen persists with the fact that you still cannot see Michelle if her ex is Detective Perez. So Judy heads off to work and Michelle shows up and apologizes for whatever Detective Perez said to her in the morning. It was uncalled for. Detective Perez told Michelle that she shouldn't be dating Judy in the first place because Judy is a riptide that it's just going to take her down. But luckily for Judy, Detective Perez does not choose who Michelle hangs out with. And out of nowhere, Judy breaks things off with Michelle in a very it's not you, it's me sort of situation. And you could tell by her face that it really bothers Judy that she has to do this. The next day, the two women are getting ready for the vigil. That's going to be that night, and Judy is visibly depressed. And Charlie heads down and asks what they're doing, and they explain that they're doing a vigil for Steve's brother. Oh, great. Did they find him? And she says, no, they haven't. He says, oh, that sucks. At least with Dad, we knew right away. And when Charlie leaves, Judy tells Jen, I can't do this. I can't pray for a safe return knowing what actually happened to him. But Judy's real concern is Steve's mom because Steve's mom's never liked her. But Jen is saying, it's going to be really weird if you're not there. And don't worry about Steve's mom. I'll protect you from her. She still thinks that it's very big if they show up because if they show up, then no one's going to suspect them. So they head to the vigil where the Holy Harmonies are performing and Pastor Wayne is kind of running point on the microphone. And Judy and Jen are handing out fake candles to everybody who's showing up. And everything's going great until Steve's mom shows up. Right away, Steve's mom is pretty rude to Judy. She thanks her for planning all this, but says, you look about the same. And when Judy says, you look well, she just cuts her off and says, I'm not. And Judy is really nervous and uncomfortable. And Jen is true to her word and saves her and says, can you do that thing that I couldn't do? And saves her from the situation. Jen goes over there and introduces herself to Steve's mom. And she thanks Jen for planning it, saying it was too difficult for me to do. Do you have any kids? And Jen says, yes, I have two boys. And Steve's mom says, oh, just like me. Well, I pray to God that you never have to go through this. And when Jen saved Judy, she just headed off to the bar where she's greeted by Howard, who's the chief of police. And he's a little surprised to see Judy there. And she says, oh, I'm just trying to support the family. And he says, were you trying to support the family when you ratted Steve out to the FBI? 
and he just leaves. That night as the prayer vigil rages on, Judy's talking to Ben, but all of a sudden, Steve's former assistant walks by and says hi to Judy, but walks over to that girl who interrupted Steve and Judy's meeting that one day, and he was clearly dating her. And Steve's assistant is consoling her, and then all of a sudden, Ben goes over and consoles her, and Judy sees that the girl was pregnant, and she gets really pissed off. So she goes over to find more information about it, and she finds out that the girl is four months pregnant, and it is Steve's child. But then the girl starts crying, and Judy feels really guilty about the fact that this child's going to grow up without a father. So when she starts crying, Judy just consoles her by saying, you gotta keep Faith alive, I'm sure he'll show up. Jen, meanwhile, is still handing out candles to the people that are showing up, and one of those people is Detective Perez. And Jen says, what are you doing here? She says, I'm working. You wouldn't believe how many times the perpetrator shows up to things like this. It's like moth to a flame. So Jen kind of drops everything she's doing to try to go find Judy, but it's clear that Judy is bothered about something, and she asks, are you okay? And Judy lets her know that the girl that Steve was seeing is pregnant. So she begs Jen to go, and Jen says, okay, yeah, no, we can go now. But at that same time, Ben hops on a microphone and thanks both of them to the entire audience for planning this whole thing out. He also says that they set up an anonymous tip line with a hefty reward. And the two women, thinking they were kind of off scot-free, are like, oh, this is great, okay, hefty reward, awesome. And after Ben's done talking, they start up a slideshow about a bunch of pictures with Steve and Ben and his mom. And it's really upsetting to Jen to look at the pictures along with how Steve's mom is reacting. And also at the same time, Charlie, who's shown up to support Ben. And in her mind, she's going through what it would be like for her if she lost one of her boys. And it's very troubling to her. And as she's getting pretty emotional, Pastor Wayne shows up telling her that she's got to have faith and that God will find the truth. But that's not exactly going to make Jen feel better since she's the one who killed him. And she walks away. And eventually Ben finds her and offers her a drink, to which she says, I thought you didn't drink. And he says, I don't, but I had to do shots for Steve, right? She apologizes, but Ben says, what are you apologizing for? You're like the only good thing about this. If there's a silver lining in this situation, it's meeting you. Ben then leads in and the two start kissing, and Judy sees that. And having been told the day before that she has to break off a relationship with Michelle, this kind of pisses off Judy. But as she turns around, she runs into Detective Perez, who says, funny seeing you here. Judy tells her that she broke things off with Michelle because she respects people's space. But Detective Perez finds that funny because she's had two big cases in the last year, and they both are linked by Judy Hale. She warns Judy to watch herself, and a drunk Judy snaps back, Fine, watch me. But all you're going to see is that I'm a good person who means well. But both Judy and Jen have a minor issue because Charlie, who is there watching the video slideshow, sees a photo of Steve pop up that has the car that he was driving and the TKG hat that Parker was wearing. And Charlie knows it's definitely not a coincidence. Episode 8, Jen comes home to find a drunk Judy, and right before Judy confronts Jen about making out with Ben, they're both confronted by Charlie, who wants to know why they had Steve's car. And on the fly, they make up a lie about how Steve gave them the car after he screwed over Jen on that bad real estate deal. He then asks how it got burned, and she says, well, it wouldn't start, and I left it there, and you know people, they just light cars on fire, but no, he doesn't know that, because that's not really a thing. So Charlie says, well, let's do the right thing, let's go to the cops about this, but she says, well, I can't, because if I go to the cops... I'm going to have to tell them how you were driving without a license and you'll never get your license. And now Charlie feels a sense of guilt and starts apologizing, but they say, don't worry about it. And as soon as they get rid of Charlie, drunk Judy asks, why is it okay for you to make out with Ben, but I can't be with Michelle? That's pretty hypocritical. And Jen reassures her that it was a mistake. And when Ben comes over tomorrow, she's going to tell him that it was a mistake and that she can't work with him anymore. I'm just kind of over this. And Judy's not. Judy says, well, we're never supposed to be happy because of what we did. And at that moment, Jen kind of sees the hypocrisy of the situation and says, look, if you want to be with Michelle, go be with Michelle. Just don't get leaky with the information with her. You still can't tell anybody what happened. So with the okay from Jen, Judy heads over to Michelle's house. No word if she was drinking and driving, but they end up making up and spending the night together. The next day, Ben shows up with flowers at Jen's doorstep, but the flowers are actually from Ben's mother because she really appreciated the fact that Jen planned that entire vigil for Steve. Jen says, thank you, but I really feel like we should talk about last night, but Ben has no recollection of last night because he was so blackout drunk, and he really regrets it because he was a year sober the previous week. So Ben asks, did I do anything stupid? And Jen decides it's best to just not say anything and say, no, you didn't, never mind. But Ben is no longer thinking of renting a property, he's thinking of buying one. And coincidentally, his mother is looking to scale down, and it's because of Steve, but it's a long story. But they want Jen to sell the house because they want somebody that Ben's mom feels comfortable with, and she feels comfortable with Jen. And initially, Jen doesn't want to do it, until she finds out it's a 10 to $15 million house, and Ben says if anybody deserves that commission, it would be you. And it's hard to say no to that commission, so Jen agrees to look at it. So Jen heads over to the Woods estate, and it is a mansion. And once again, their mom thanks Jen for all she did, saying it meant everything. And when Steve comes home, I'll make sure that he thanks you himself. She then lets Ben give Jen a tour of the house. And while doing so, Jen notices a picture of Ben and Steve when they were kids at the beach, but Ben is wearing a turtleneck, and he says, yeah, it's because I had all those scars from the surgeries, and I was just really self-conscious being around girls that they wouldn't get it. But Jen, 
who also has scars from her mastectomy, says, I think scars are a good thing because it shows that you went through something traumatic and you came out on the other side. Afterwards, Jen goes and picks up Charlie and lets him know that business is going so well that she thinks she can get him a car. But when they get home, somebody has spray painted, I know what you did on their garage door. Jen tells Charlie to get inside and then heads over to Karen's place to look at the security camera footage. But Karen doesn't answer. It's her husband. And her husband lets her know that Karen and him are splitting up, but she doesn't want to hear any of that. She just wants to see the security camera footage and to see who did it. And after she sees who did it, she asks, hey, can you delete this along with like the last month off the cloud? And he agrees and she goes back home where she approaches Charlie asking, what did you do to Parker where she would spray paint that on our garage door? And Charlie goes on to explain that it's not a big deal. He just met somebody else, but she says it is a big deal. I mean, when you love somebody and they just leave you like that, it's hurtful. And she then orders Charlie to go clean it up with paint from the garage. Judy, meanwhile, headed off to work where she went to Flo's room, but Flo isn't there and something clearly happened. And she finds out that she's in the intensive care unit. So Judy sneaks in and sees Michelle leaving her mom's room. And Michelle is happy to see her and a bit surprised. And that's the exact opposite reaction from Detective Perez, who is also there. She once again, in front of Judy, mind you, reiterates to Michelle that she shouldn't be seeing her because she's a riptide. But since both of them don't get the reference, she says, let me make it easy for you. The best case scenario is she's an unstable accused stalker who Detective Perez has personally arrested for destruction of property. Now, the worst case scenario is she's involved in an active investigation where her ex fiance has gone missing and is probably dead. And Detective Perez just doesn't want Michelle to end up another victim. But this is a lot to take in for Michelle, who is dealing with her mother being in intensive care, and she just walks away saying, I can't deal with this right now. And Judy and Detective Perez go their separate ways in the hospital. And while walking around the hospital, Judy sees the NICU with all the newborn babies, and a woman's walking out who was a cuddler, and basically her job is just to cuddle the newborns. And Judy loves that idea of a job, and the woman says, yeah, I get out of it more than the babies do. The woman even suggests that Judy become one, and she says, you can do that? She says, yeah, you just have to interview, and they have to do a background check to weed out the criminals. But Judy probably wouldn't have passed a background check. When she returns, Detective Perez is sitting down crying and Judy asks if there's any news on Flo. And Detective Perez reluctantly lets her know that she's on life support and it's not looking good. And Detective Perez is really broken up about this and crying a lot because Detective Perez lost her mother at an early age and Flo has really been that mother that she hasn't had. Judy, looking to make Detective Perez feel better, tells her how she lost her mother a while ago too. She then offers to give Detective Perez a hug, but Detective Perez doesn't want that. So Judy does the next best thing and grabs her a box of tissues. But Judy's mom is not dead, and that night she tries to get a hold of her, but she's unsuccessful. And while Judy is trying to get in touch with her mom, Jen gets a visit from Ben who says, I'm sick of lying. I'm sick of acting like I don't remember what happened last night, and I only did it because I was drunk. I did it because I wanted to for a while, and the two end up hooking up and spending the night together. Now, Charlie did end up cleaning up the spray paint from the garage, but when he comes back into the garage, he notices the gas can. And then he goes into his book bag where he took a toiletry bag from Steve's car that had a phone and a flash drive on it, and he opens the phone and calls the last number in it, and it ends up being the Laguna chief of police on the other end. And the chief, of course, thinks it's Steve calling, but Charlie just hangs up. Now, the chief of police has put Nick on the tip line, and Nick's having an issue because it's kind of hard to handle a tip line when the missing suspect's twin is walking around town. But the chief is very adamant that they need to find whoever did this to Steve because Steve is a good guy. And Nick says he's so good that he was being investigated by the FBI. But the chief has it convinced in his head that that was just Judy Hale trying to get revenge. But Nick doesn't buy that an art teacher was trying to get revenge on her ex-fiance. He thinks it has more to do with the fact that Steve was wrapped up with the Greek mafia. And the chief just acts like Nick is going crazy again. But that night, Nick gets a phone call from the tip line and it's Parker who has some very interesting information that she thinks that Nick should see. In episode 9, Jen awakes next to Steve in her bed and immediately regrets what she did. She shimmies onto the bathroom and when she comes out of the shower, she tries to end things with Ben. But he doesn't understand. And Jen is simply freaked out with the fact that she just slept with a guy that looks identical to the person she killed. And even though Ben makes a really good plea, Jen tells him you gotta get out. And as soon as he leaves, Jen starts crying. When Ben makes the walk of shame, he runs into Charlie and immediately makes an excuse about how he needed to meet his mom there for an early meeting. But as he's leaving, it's pretty obvious that he's sad and upset and he tells Charlie... Hey, take care of your mom, and then he walks out. That same morning, Judy heads to prison because she's visiting her mom, who's an inmate. And this is the first time in 15 years that she's even seeing her mother. But it was a simple miscommunication because while Judy was sending her mom letters, her mom was sending letters back, but Judy wasn't getting them. And because Judy wasn't responding, her mom didn't feel it necessary to call her because she didn't think that Judy wanted to be in her life anymore. 
And because of what happened with Flo, Judy is heading there to make amends with her mom. And her mom, even though she's in prison, is the happiest she's been in a while because she's clean and sober and comfortable. So the two catch up and Judy asks her mom how she ended up in prison, but her mom says, I can't really talk about it. But it's the system. Because once you come in here, you just keep coming back and back and back. Judy then apologizes for ratting her mom out on the stand when she was a kid, but her mom says, don't worry about it. It was a long time ago and I should have never let you take the stand anyway. You were a kid. You didn't know what you were doing. But Judy lets her know, I think about it every day and I'm regretful for it. So after Judy leaves the prison, she goes over to talk to Detective Perez, and she's brought a peace offering of a picture she drew of Flo for Detective Perez. But the real reason she's shown up is because she wants to know if Detective Perez has any idea where her paintings are from TKG Arts. But Detective Perez calls Nick over, and they want to know if Judy knows anything about what Parker showed Nick, which were the pictures that Parker took off Instagram that clearly show Charlie, Parker, Steve's car, and Steve's hat. Judy immediately says it's not what it looks like, but she's having a lot of trouble explaining it. And Detective Perez and Nick want the truth because the police chief is giving them pressure to make an arrest and he's pointing them in the direction of Judy. But all the evidence right now is pointing to Charlie and they'd have motive and they'd clearly have evidence. But Judy reassures him that Charlie had nothing to do with it, although she's not saying anything else. So Judy immediately heads over to Jen's place and Jen has had quite a day. She started off the morning learning that her stop sign petition got rejected by the city council. So she decided to get the rejection in person. She's headed over to the city council meeting and wants to know why they rejected her stop sign. But the real reason they rejected it is because one of the people on the city council is the guy who didn't know the meaning of no when Jen was trying to find the car. And after Jen brings up safety, he has the audacity to actually say, it's amazing to me you're bringing up safety when you assaulted me not too long ago. But this is Jen Harding we're talking about, so she puts the guy on blast in a hashtag MeToo moment, letting the entire courtroom know exactly what he did. She also makes mention that maybe if there was a stop sign in the road where her husband was killed, he would still be there today. And then she just drops the mic and walks off stage. And then when she got home, Henry's upset because Shandy told Henry that she's the one who killed his bird. She also told Henry that Jen told her to lie about it. And now Henry feels betrayed by the both of them. And the only person he really wants to talk to and see right now is Judy, but she's not there. And as Jen is leaving Henry's room, she runs into Charlie who wants some answers. But Jen tells him that Steve was mixed up with some really bad people and basically shut up and don't worry about it. Now Charlie is holding that little toiletry bag that he took from Steve's car and when Jen asks, hey, what is that? He says, oh, never mind, it's nothing. So when Judy finally shows up at Jen's house, Jen is very stressed out. And Judy lets her know that the cops have pictures of Charlie driving around Laguna with Steve's car and the Instagram photos, and they think that Charlie's the one who killed Steve. But she's going to take the fall. And Jen says, you can't do that. But she says, I'm not asking, I'm telling you I'm taking the fall. And Judy feels like she has to do this because the night that Steve died, Judy was going to commit suicide. And then she got Jen's phone call. And she feels like she was saved that night to repay the debt. And Jen finally comes clean that you're not the reason why Steve is dead. I killed him. She goes on to explain the reason why she murdered Steve. And one of those nasty comments that we hadn't heard before was Ted wanted out of the relationship so bad that he jumped in front of their car. And that's something that Jen has kind of always felt was true, was that she alienated her husband so badly that he actually jumped in front of a car. She starts bawling her eyes out saying that her husband hated her and her kids hate her and she's just a piece of shit. Now, right after hearing that Jen was the one who murdered Steve, Judy started crying. But then after hearing Jen go on with the story, she feels the need to console Jen. And as Jen is saying how everybody hates her, Judy says, well, I never hated you. And Jen says, of course you don't. That's because you gravitate to anybody who will give you a little morsel of attention. Even if it's abusive attention. That's why you stay with Steve. That's why you love your mom. It's like you get off on it or something. You'll just stick around for anybody. And as soon as those words come out of her mouth, she knows that she made a mistake. Judy tries to get out of there, but Jen is saying, no, stop, I'm sorry, just hit me, punch me in the face. And as she's begging to get punched, Judy says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not like you. So Jen then tries to block the car from leaving, but finally Judy screams at the top of her lungs, stop it, just stop it. And she starts hysterically crying. Jen goes to console her and takes her inside and puts her to bed. And then she writes a letter to Charlie, Judy, and Henry, puts the bird that she killed Steve with in the safe along with the gun, takes out a binder, puts all the letters in a binder, and then heads over to Detective Perez's house to turn herself in. So in episode 10, Jen tries to confess to Detective Perez, who's going through a tough time because Michelle moved out. But Detective Perez needs more than just Jen's word that she did it. So the two head to the forest, start looking for where they buried the body, but they can't find that location anywhere. And after searching and searching and searching, Detective Perez just finally calls her over to the car and says, we're leaving. Because Detective Perez feels like it's just nothing more than a mother trying to protect her child from a crime. Another possibility is that Judy Hale did it, and she's once again trying to pay off Jen. 
And Detective Perez cannot figure out why so many people are obsessed with Judy Hale. It's like she has a spell on everybody. And Jen says, what do you mean? She says, well, she killed your husband and you love her. Like, what is up with that? And Jen thinks about it and says it's because she sees the good in people. And Judy, meanwhile, has woken up and found the letters and is panicking because she knows that Jen has gone to turn herself in. And she's trying to keep it from the kids. But Charlie knows that his mom didn't come home last night and he's worried. He gives Judy the toiletry bag and says that there's a flash drive in there, but some weird language like Hebrew, I couldn't read it. And she says, it's Greek. And she gives Charlie a hug and says, thank you so much. And then immediately takes it over to Nick. She tells Nick that if I give you what I'm about to give you, I need your word that you'll do everything to protect Jen. The problem is Nick has no idea what she's talking about because Jen hasn't shown up to confess anything. She went straight to Detective Perez's house. So when Nick says, what are you talking about? She says, I mean, just hypothetically speaking, if Jen is ever in trouble, you'll protect her. But Nick isn't really concerned about that at this time because he heard the voicemails from Steve and he just wants to know why in the world Judy would stay with a guy like that as opposed to Nick. She says, I guess I figured you get what you deserve, but he says nobody deserved that. He then picks up one of the items from the bag and it's a voice recorder. And Judy says, I listen to that. Make sure you listen to that privately where the chief can't hear himself. And then she leaves. And as Nick is staring at it, he realizes what she just said and goes, oh my God. So as Detective Perez and Jen are heading back from the forest, Detective Perez gets a text from Nick saying, we got him. And at that same moment, Jen says, all right, what happens now? She says, we'll drive back, you'll give a statement, and you'll be formally charged. That's protocol. But you're just going to go home. And we're never going to talk about what we didn't find out in these woods. And Jen is very confused, but Detective Perez says, I'm not trying to be a cop right now. I just want to be a person. And sometimes justice works itself out. So go home with your kids and tell them you love them. And just as Judy is about to tell both Henry and Charlie what happened to their mom, Jen walks through the door because Judy never gave the kids their letters. And the first thing Jen says is, let me explain the letters, but Judy lets her know with her eyes that I didn't even give it to her. When Jen and Judy get alone, Jen apologizes for what she said the previous night and also apologizes for lying to her. But Judy forgives her. She tells her, I don't want to carry around any more pain anymore. I'm tired of it. And really, resenting Jen would just be punishing herself. Afterwards, Judy heads to the prison to talk to her mom, who was kind of hinting at Judy hiring a lawyer for her to get her out. But Judy says, yeah, I couldn't find the money to do that. Her mom then says, you know, it would be great if you just wrote the board a letter saying I've changed. But Judy's not doing that either because she looks at her mom and says, you know what, mom, you haven't changed. And she walks out. When she gets back home, Detective Perez has shown up with all of her paintings. And this is a huge deal to Judy who thought they were lost forever. And this is really a thank you from Detective Perez because Judy gave them that bag from Steve's car that indicted the chief. And the chief is going away to federal prison for a long time. And right before Detective Perez leaves, Judy says, I just want to let you know, I think you're a really special person. And Detective Perez looks right at her dead in the eye and says, I hope I never see you again. But, you know, that's Judy Hale for you. So with Detective Perez long gone, Judy starts busting open those paintings. Because the reason she wanted them so badly wasn't because she was attached to them. It was because there was money hidden inside the frames. And I'm talking a lot of money. And with all of that money, she decides to buy Lorna out of Jen's house. Initially, Lorna thinks that she's just trying to get bought out of their lives. But Jen says, no, you're the kid's only grandmother. And I do appreciate that. Which is another reason why I can't work for you anymore. Lorna says, is it because you just found a 15 and $20 million property? And Jen says, no, it's not. And actually, I'm gifting that to you as well. But Jen asked her to be nice to Mrs. Woods because she could really use a friend right now who knows what she's going through. And with Lorna losing Ted and Mrs. Woods probably losing Steve, the two would get along great. And in all honesty, with a $20 million commission, Lorna's going to get along great with anybody. And speaking of the Woods, Ben is packing up the house along with his mom. And his mom makes mention that Jen was asking about him and that he should call her before he leaves town. So he goes into a separate room and is looking at the number. And right before he's about to call, he gets a phone call. And the phone call lets him know that Steve's body's been found in the woods by a hiker's dog. But instead of telling his mom, he just says, I'm going to go get us some ice cream and leaves. And he doesn't go to get ice cream. He goes to the liquor store and grabs a bottle. Jen and Judy, meanwhile, have taken the rest of Judy's money to go get Charlie a car. And with Jen and Judy out of the house, Charlie sneaks into Judy's room to try to get some weed. But he finds Jen's letter to Judy. And in that letter, Jen states, I'm sorry for not forgiving you sooner for Ted. So now Charlie knows or at least has an idea of what happened and who killed his father. As Jen and Judy are driving back from the car dealership, they start talking about how they might take a vacation. But as they're doing so, they need to slam on the brakes because the city council has put in that stop sign that Jen was fighting so hard to get. And as they're celebrating their little moral victory, they inch out into the intersection, but they're hit because some guy blew that stop sign. And as Judy is asking Jen if she's okay because the car was hit on the driver's side, Ben, who was the driver who hit Jen, is drunk and he's realizing what he did and he backs up the car and he does a hit and run. Season 3 picks up right where Season 2 left off. Judy rushes Jen to the hospital. Judy's fine. She's a little banged up, but Jen is in rough shape. She's responsive, but she took the brunt of the hit. 
Both women, though, are admitted to the hospital. They're both sitting next to each other. And Jen just can't believe that it's another hit and run. Jen then asks Judy, does Charlie know? And Judy tells her, no, but you should probably call him. And Jen's a little bit hesitant to do that because Charlie's had such a tough year. But Charlie's tough year got even tougher because he found the letters. The letters from his mom that she wrote to Judy. So at this point, he knows that his mother hasn't been telling him something, but he doesn't have much time to figure it out because the doorbell rings, and when he goes to answer it, to his surprise, it's a very bloody Ben looking for Jen. Charlie asks Ben if he's all right because his face is all banged up, but Ben seems very out of it, and then he just face plants. Charlie has to pick him up, put him back into Ben's car, and eventually take him to the hospital. When he gets in the car, he sees the vodka bottle, so he knows that Ben's drunk. He sees the windshield, so he knows that Ben was drinking and driving and probably hit something. But when Charlie asks Ben what happened, Ben tells him, I don't really remember. He tells Charlie the last thing he remembers is finding out that they found Steve's body in the woods, and he gets pretty emotional about it. When Ben eventually pulls himself together, he asks Charlie, can you just keep this between us? It could be really bad news if people found out I was drinking and driving and hit something. Don't even tell your mom. Right before Charlie's about to take Ben to the hospital, he gets a phone call from his mother, but he sends it to voicemail. He then drives him unknowingly to the same hospital where his mother and Judy are. And his mom and Judy have found out that they have to go for CAT scans, which Judy's all right with, but Jen wants to get the hell out of there. She has no interest in spending Charlie's birthday in the hospital. But as Judy heads off to go take care of hers, Jen gets a phone call, and as she's reaching for the phone, she knocks over her cup of ice, so now her bed's all wet which makes her more frustrated. But who she thought would be Charlie ends up being Detective Perez under the line. Both Detective Perez and Nick headed to the scene of where they found Steve's body, and Detective Perez was really trying to cover for Jen. Nick, being the good cop, was trying to get to the bottom of how this body showed up where it did, who might have done something to it. But Detective Perez was able to sneak away for a little bit and make a phone call to Jen. Unfortunately, she's in the middle of the woods and it's pretty garbled. Detective Perez isn't even able to tell Jen about the body because Nick walks up and tells her that the person who found the body is ready to make a statement. And the lady that found the body recognizes Detective Perez. She even says, I've seen you here before, but Detective Perez is adamant, no, you haven't. But she definitely did. As Detective Perez starts to take down this woman's statement, Jen is calling her back but getting no answer. And finally, Jen has had enough. She rips out all the wires and she's ready to just walk out of the hospital. But one of the nurses walks in with a police officer, and they joke about how they thought they had a runner. So Jen has to improvise and say, nope, I was just getting ready to go and do my CAT scan. As Jen goes off to do her CAT scan, Judy is returning from hers, and she's sweet-talking the nurse. She has a certain set of skills, a set of skills that makes it a nightmare on hospitals like this one. When she was a kid, she would fake a seizure so her mom could sneak in and steal meds from the hospital, and she had a very convincing fake seizure. So as she's sweet-talking the nurse, she starts to fake a seizure while simultaneously stealing the nurse's badge. And when the nurse goes to grab her something to drink, Judy is able to sneak in and steal Jen some pills to make the pain go away quicker. Judy then returns to the room, sneaks the pills under the bed, and she sees the phone's ringing, and it's Charlie. She doesn't quite know what to tell Charlie. She doesn't want to break the news to him. And Charlie, after reading the letter, isn't really in the mood to talk to Judy Hale. Charlie eventually says, Judy, I read the letter, but Judy doesn't know what he's talking about. And Charlie gets so frustrated that he hangs up the phone. At that moment, Ben comes around the corner and knocks into Judy. Since being at the hospital, some of his memory has come back. Like the fact that he was in a hit and run and he was the driver. It made him a little sick, but it makes him even more sick when he finds out from Judy that they're in the hospital because they got hit by a hit and run driver. While Ben doesn't own up to it, he knows that he was the one driving the car. The excuse on why he's at the hospital, he tells Judy, is because he fell, hit his head. Ben then tells Judy that they found Steve's body. Judy gives him a big hug and starts to apologize to him, but now she's a little bit concerned for another reason. At the moment that Ben is telling Judy this, Jen has returned from her CAT scan, and she's actually sitting in Judy's bed because her bed is still wet from the spilled drink. The doctor comes in and tells her that nothing's broken, but unfortunately the CAT scan found something. A mass. A few of them. So she's going to have to go to an oncologist, because there's a very real chance that she has cancer. But the doctor thinks that he's talking to Judy, because 
Jen is sitting in Judy's bed, which means that Jen is fine, besides a few bruised ribs. Judy, on the other hand, she might be living with cancer. It's a relief to Jen, but now she has to figure out a way to tell Judy this. And when Judy returns, Jen doesn't say a word. Judy gives Jen the bad news about Steve's body being discovered, which, of course, doesn't sit well with Jen. But when Jen calms down a little bit, Judy pulls out the pills that she stole for Jen, and they have a good laugh about it. Judy looks Jen in the eye and says, I know this is a lot, but we've been through a lot this year already, and we survived because we had each other. They give each other a hug, but Jen still hasn't told Judy what she knows. In episode two, Jen is trying to talk herself up to telling Judy about the cancer, but she ironically gets interrupted by Judy, who wants to make sure everything's all right in the bathroom. When Jen exits, she finds Judy making cupcakes for Charlie because, after all, it still is his birthday. That's when Jen sits Judy down and she says, we have something to talk about. And Judy says, I know, they found Steve's body. Jen uses this as an excuse to push the cancer talk to the side. As usual, Judy Hale has found a spin job to make this a positive, that they no longer have to deal with the pressure of Steve's body and the fact that Steve's family gets some closure. When this conversation hits a lull, it does open the door for Jen to tell Judy about the cancer, but instead, she just asks her, do you want some wine? And Judy says, yeah, I'll grab some weed. Judy goes into the guest house, but she's shocked to find Charlie sitting there on her bed with a gun. She quickly calls Jen in, and Charlie looks at both of them and says, did you kill Steve Woods? I mean, you wrote us goodbye letters, and you were going to leave us here with her? After what she did with Dad? Both women are pretty confused on how Charlie found out that Judy was the one who killed Ted. But what Charlie actually thinks happened is that Judy had an affair with Ted, which in a weird way is a relief for both women. Charlie looks at his mom and says, all I know is that Steve Woods is dead and you guys look guilty as hell. So what happened? Why did you burn his car? Jen starts gaslighting Charlie a little bit, putting on the waterworks, but the story she tells him is that it was the Greek mafia. She burned the car because... Steve was involved with them, and she didn't want it getting back to her, so she got rid of any evidence. She told the police, and they bought it hook, line, and sinker, because they know how innocent she is. It's a relief for them because it seems like Charlie does buy this. But when it comes to Judy and Ted, Jen doesn't let Judy tell the truth. She says, nope, Charlie, you caught us there. Yep, Judy had an affair with your dad, but you know what? I forgave her because she seemed really regretful about it. Judy goes along with the lie, and it gets Charlie to calm down a little bit and hand over the gun to his mom. Jen goes to put it back in the safe, the same safe that she was keeping the bird that she killed Steve with, but the bird isn't there. And when she asks Charlie what happened to it, he tells her, I gave it back to Henry. It is his, after all. And the problem is, Henry's not at the house. He's over at Shandy's, so she's going to have to wait to get that bird back. When both Judy and Jen get back in the house, they start kind of yelling at each other for how they handled that. Judy doesn't appreciate the lie that Jen told because she feels like when Charlie does find out the truth, he's going to hate her even more. But the way that Jen looks at it, this lie is way better than the truth. There's then a knock at the door, and they get a little spooked because it's Detective Perez and Nick. Although, they're not there for the Steve Woods situation. They do bring it up, but they're there to get their statements regarding the hit and run. Before they get the statements, they do let them know that Steve Woods' body was found on federal land, which means it's now an FBI issue. They then split up to get the statements, with Perez going with Jen and Nick staying with Judy. Judy doesn't really give Nick much to go on. She's pretty vague. But Nick's worried. He has a hunch that all of this is connected. Steve Woods, the Greeks, her hit and run. So he wants her to keep on the lookout for anybody who looks suspicious, if she might be followed, anything like that. In the kitchen, though, it's a much different conversation between Jen and Perez. Jen asks Perez, there's got to be something you can do to help me. But she says, no, I could lose everything. No, you're on your own with this one. But Jen reminds Perez that she tried to do the right thing. She tried to turn herself in, and it was Perez who stopped her from doing so. So Perez is in this whether she likes it or not. And Perez reluctantly says, all right, fine, I'll see what I can do. Once both police leave, the two women fill each other in on what they were discussing with the detectives. Jen gets pretty close to telling Judy about the cancer, but Charlie interrupts by getting something to drink. And Judy lets him know, your birthday cupcakes are almost ready. But he looks at her and says, I don't want your stupid cupcakes, and walks out. He's still pissed. They then hear somebody pull up in the driveway, and when they go outside to see who it is, it's Lorna. In a brand new car. For Charlie, for his birthday. Which doesn't sit well with Jen at all. Judy was planning on buying Charlie that Kia, but... 
This car is way better. Lorna makes mention that Ted would have loved to be there to see Charlie get his first car. And then she looks at Judy and says, you know, you never get over losing a husband or a father or a son. You wouldn't know. And Lorna has no idea how hurtful that comment is. Judy gets so upset that she walks into the house and Jen goes after her to make sure she's okay. But she's not. That comment really hurt. It's also not helping that Charlie, not knowing the truth about what happened to his father, is just eating her up. She really wants to tell Charlie the truth. It's Jen, though, that tells her, look, I I get you want to tell him, but Charlie has to be in the right place, and that's not right now. Jen then gets up to go look for the bird in Henry's room. But as she's going up the steps, she slips and falls and hurts herself, and there's an untimely knock at the door, but this time, it's Ben. He's brought a care package for Jen, and when he sees her lying on the floor, he decides to pick her up and take her to her room. Both Judy and Ben start trying to take care of Jen, make sure she's comfortable. Ben tells Jen that he's sorry about the accident. She tells him that she's sorry about Steve. But as for how he's doing, it's still difficult. You know, he had his issues with his brother, but it's always tough losing a family member. He tells both women that, you know, it's weird to say, but I just don't know who I am without him. As they're trying to give Ben a little bit of advice, Henry finally walks in. This is the first time Henry is seeing his mom, so he's a little concerned, but they let him know that she was in an accident and they don't know who did it. A little bit awkward for Ben. So much so that he has to excuse himself into the bathroom where he just needs to splash some water on his face and look in the mirror. When he does, though, all he can see is Steve's face. He eventually leaves the bathroom and he runs into Henry. Henry tells him, I'm sorry about your brother, my mom told me, and losing somebody sucks. But it does get easier. He then gives Ben a hug and he also gives him the bird. Same bird that was used to kill Steve. Later that night, it's finally time to have that uncomfortable cancer talk. But it's actually Judy that brings it up to Jen. Because when Judy was going through Jen's purse to find something, she found the pamphlets. And she figures that it's Jen who has cancer. This forces Jen to break the news to her that, no, I don't have it. I'm fine. It might actually be you. And if there's one person that could spin a cancer diagnosis or the possibility of one, it would be Judy Hale. Even Judy, though, is having trouble with this. It's a complete shock. And she tries to put on a good face, but, you know, it's tough. She then goes downstairs to finish up the cupcakes for the birthday boy. Charlie walks in the room, and when Judy asks to talk, he just blurts out, how did you guys meet? Forces Judy to make up a story about meeting him quickly. It happened so fast. It was a one-time thing. Deep down, though, she really does want to tell Charlie the actual truth. At the end of her apology, Charlie grabs a cupcake, so it seems like he's forgiven her. For now, at least. Upstairs, though, Jen is tucking Henry in, and she decides to ask him about the bird and where it is. But that's when he reveals that he gave it away to Ben. And Ben has taken it to a bar and is kind of just drinking by himself with his thoughts. But his phone rings, and it's his Uber ride. So he gets up to leave, and he accidentally leaves the bird back at the bar. Which is unfortunate, because he was being watched the whole time by Nick. You don't know if Nick was tailing him or he just happened to be in that bar, but Nick grabs the bird and keeps it. In episode three, Judy and Jen head to the oncologist. And it's actually Jen who's way more on edge than Judy. I mean, Judy's nervous, but Jen's Jen yelling at the nurse because it's taking so long until finally Jen gets a phone call that thankfully for the nurse pulls her away. It's Detective Perez. She needs to talk immediately and the two meet up. Perez shows her what the FBI found, which is a chunk of wood in Steve's skull. Immediately, Jen knows that it's the tail to the bird. But when Perez asks, okay, where is this bird now? Jen has to reveal that she doesn't have it on her person, but she can get it, not to worry. Perez tells her that she needs to get it back and get rid of it immediately. The FBI agent that's on this case is named Moranis, and he's really, really good. It happens to be the same FBI agent that Judy went to to deal with the Greek situation. But this whole situation, helping Jen out, all of that, has got Detective Perez very, very paranoid. Of course, the actual location with the bird is in the possession of Nick, who goes to give it back to Ben. Ben is dealing with a tough time. Not only is he going through the grieving process, but so is his mother, and she's going through a tough time as well. To make it worse for Ben, when he goes out in the garage, he sees the car, the car that he knows now, hit and ran Judy and Jen. He also can't help but hear his brother yell at him that he was going to drink and drive, and how he was a loser, 
And now he's thinking that maybe Steve was on to something and maybe Steve was right. He snaps out of it, covers up the car, and that's when Nick shows up. And it gets Ben pretty skittish. Nick then explains why he's there, and he holds up the bird. And he also swears that it was broken when he found it, which Ben confirms, yeah, I know it was. Nick then has a conversation about Ben even being at the bar, how he looked. He's seen it before. He gives Ben his card and says, look, man, if you ever want to go to a meeting, just let me know. I've been where you are now. It never ends well, so just give me a call if you need help. Ben really appreciates it, and then Nick says, hey, I'm sorry what happened to your brother. I really wish I could help with the case, but they got me on this hit and run with Judy and Jen. It's unfortunate because Ben had finally gotten a little bit comfortable, but now he's back to being on edge. He asks Nick, do you have any leads? And Nick says, no, no car, no crime. He then wraps up the conversation and says, all right, man, just take care of yourself. A little while later, Judy leaves the doctor's office. She went through her scans. She even bought a new necklace from the gift shop, but she doesn't find out the results until later that day. She calls up Jen and asks her what happened with Perez, and Jen fills her in. When Judy finds out that Moranis is on the case, she's actually excited about it. She thinks he's a great guy, even though Jen gets pretty concerned about it. Jen then hangs up the phone and heads over to Ben's place. Ben, though, isn't there. His mom is. Even though Jen is looking for Ben, she did bring ice cream for Eileen to make her feel better. And when Jen sees the state of Eileen, she knows that she really needs it. So even with Ben not there, she decides to head in and just spend some time with her. Jen knows what it's like to grieve someone you love that's gone too soon. So she gives Eileen some tips and just seems like a friend to her. As Jen cheers up Eileen, Judy goes and heads to find Glenn. She has an idea of where he'll be. He stays at the same motel. Sure enough, that's where he is. They quickly get caught up on their personal lives, but the whole time... Judy is just doing reconnaissance trying to find out what Glenn might know. The excuse that she uses for even being there is that she thinks she's being followed. While she tries to come up with a story on this fake person who's following her, she does see the FBI folder of the Steve Woods case. She then starts to fish, telling Glenn Nick's theory that it's all connected. What happened to Steve? What happened to her? But putting this theory in Glenn's head was a smart move because he starts to think about it. He doesn't quite understand why the Greeks would come after Judy, but it is something he hadn't considered before. Even though Glenn is on the case, it's not something that either Nick or Detective Perez can just forget. Perez is offered to be the FBI Laguna liaison on the case, so she's obtained the autopsy report. She doesn't really want to show it to Nick, but it'd be fishy if she didn't. So she has to show Nick what she's got, which is the piece of wood that was found in Steve's skull. Luckily, Nick has no idea what it is either. But if he goes to any home goods store or hobby store, he's going to have an easy time finding it because that bird is readily available. So much so that Ben wants to fix it. So he goes and finds a bunch of matching birds at a store so that he can cut off one tail and replace it. The thing is, Ben doesn't know how to actually do any of that. He's not very crafty. So he goes and interrupts Judy, who is counting some more of her Steve money, and he asks her for help. Judy's pretty relieved that Ben just wanted her to fix it and didn't ask any more questions. But before he leaves, Ben does have one question. How's Jen doing? And Judy fills him in on the fact that it's just a really tough time right now. Jen, though, is nowhere to be found because she's gone to drive Henry to his Holy Harmonies practice. And a little while later, that's exactly where Ben finds her. Along with Judy's help, he was able to fix the bird and he wants to give it back to Henry. He also wants to thank Jen because... Whatever she said to his mom really helped. She finally showered, and she seems to be doing better, so he really appreciates that. The fact, though, that Jen has the bird back in her possession is a big relief. I wish I could say the same thing about Judy. Because as Jen is getting the bird back, Judy is getting the phone call from the oncologist that lets her know that they did, in fact, find cancer. But typical Judy Hale, she feels bad for the person who has to deliver the news and not herself. When Jen returns home, she finds Judy drinking some wine, and she thanks her because she shows her the bird that she has. The conversation gets pretty emotional, though, because Jen gets really upset at the thought of losing Judy. She starts telling her that she wouldn't be able to forgive herself if Judy actually got sick, because she would blame herself. With Jen crying in front of her, Judy can't bring herself to tell her the news, so she lies, telling her, you have nothing to worry about. I'm healthy. It came back clean. 
That's a big relief to Jen. They both enjoy some wine, and then they take care of that bird, burning it and getting rid of the ashes. As Jen is throwing out the ashes, though, she notices a suspicious car that's parked down the block with somebody in it. She thinks about what Perez was telling her about being tailed. She does find it fishy. She probably should, because Glenn's in that car. Although, Jen can't see him. In episode four, Jen gets ready for Steve's funeral. She's actually going to go. She's going to go with Judy, but Judy, before she goes, has to visit with the oncologist for the first time. The doctor explains to Judy that she's got cervical cancer, and she gives her her options, which is basically chemotherapy. Judy's in a little bit of denial because she feels fine. She thinks that there might have been a mistake on the scans, but there was no mistake, and the doctor tries to explain that. After she leaves the doctor's office, she goes and meets up with Jen at the funeral. Jen, though, is under the impression that Judy has car troubles. That's what Judy told her. In order to get some free time to go to the oncologist, she told her that she had to take her car to the mechanic. So Jen asks her, do I have to take you to work? And Judy says, oh, no, no, um, mechanic said my car's fine. Jen thinks something's up with Judy, but Judy says, yeah, I mean, this is awful. We're at a funeral. As they both are discussing whether or not they should just sneak out of there, Ben walks up and thanks him for coming. While Ben is holding up okay, his mother is not. His mother is standing at the casket just screaming. Eventually, Eileen pulls it together, and both Eileen, Ben, along with Ben's father, greet mourners at the casket and thank them for coming. Eventually, this includes Judy and Jen, although they're surprised when they actually get to the casket because there's just a suit in there. The body was too decomposed, so it couldn't be displayed. Lorna walks up and explains to him that the body was just too far gone. But the thing that Lorna is most upset about isn't the fact that she's at a funeral or the fact that Steve even died. It's the fact that Eileen is no longer selling the house, which means she loses out on that big commission. Jen wants to get the hell out of the conversation with Lorna pretty quickly, so she walks up to Eileen. And Eileen thanks her for coming, but tells her that Ben's going through a really tough time. Even though he's put on a strong face, he could really use a friend. Even though Jen really wants to leave, she doesn't. She seeks Ben out. She finds him inside the house, and they make small talk. Turns out Ben is not going back home. The FBI asks him to stick around while they go through the case. He then introduces Jen to his father. But when his dad asks Ben to go get him a drink, which leaves Jen alone with him, Ben's dad grabs her ass and it gets awkward, so she gets the hell out of there. She starts looking throughout the house for the bathroom, but every door is locked. And when she finally finds one that's unlocked, she walks through it and it's a room full of dolls. Creepy looking dolls. And unfortunately the door closes and she's locked in. It forces her to call Ben up, and Ben knows where she is right away. Steve walks in and explains to the creepy dolls that his mom collected them. They're all twin dolls. They have no idea whether she bought them as a set or just collected them separately, but yeah, it's, it's a weird hobby. With a lull in the conversation, Jen asks Ben, how you doing? And he says, yeah, I'm not exactly living my best life here. I mean, I've been trying to keep it together for my parents, but I don't know how much longer I can do that. She tells him that he probably needs to let it out, and then she shows him her tactic for doing that, listening to hardcore music. As they sit in Jen's car listening to death metal, he doesn't really get the same cathartic release as she does. He decides to play her some of his music, which is horrible, and they just have a good laugh about the differences in style. Jen then gives Ben some more tips on how to deal with grief. But the thing that's really weighing him down is the fact that he hasn't told Jen that he hit her. So he finally comes clean, telling her that he was the one driving the day of the hit and run. Instead of getting angry, though, she just kisses him, and the two end up hooking up in her car. Now, Judy had gotten the okay to dip out of that wig, so she headed off to work. She ends up getting fired, though, because when she showed up, she saw Flo arguing with the nurse about letting her out of the building. Judy felt guilty, so she decided to sneak her out. What she didn't realize was Flo is immunocompromised. There's a reason why she was kept in that building. So Judy put her in real danger. It caused her boss to have to fire her on the spot. Michelle, who has been blowing Judy off, runs out and asks Judy, all right, did she take anything else? And Judy fills her in on everything that Flo ate that day or drank that day. They then have to deal with the awkwardness of the fact that Judy has been reaching out to Michelle and Michelle hasn't responded. And Michelle tells her, yeah, I got your text. I just didn't respond. Gets even more awkward, so Judy apologizes for everything she did to Flo, telling Michelle that she hopes she's going to be okay, and she gets ready to leave, but Michelle says, my mom's going to be fine. She actually had the time of her life today with you, so I should thank you. 
it starts back up a conversation between the two about how Michelle's doing with everything. And she tells Judy, I'm falling apart at the seams over here. She's stressed out. She's not sleeping. And what she needs is a distraction. So Judy says, do you want to go hang out? They head over to Michelle's place, and Michelle reads some tarot cards for Judy, which gets a little weird because one of the cards is the card of death. Michelle tells her that she thinks the card was probably meant for her because her restaurant closed the week before. It's not all bad news, though. She's got a possibility to move up to Sonoma and open up her own restaurant, and the thought of that is extremely exciting, but she can't bring herself to leave her mom at the moment. And Judy's advice is, you gotta live your own life. Your mom would want that for you. Not too long after, these two end up hooking up. As they're enjoying some pillow talk, Michelle tells Judy, I didn't know how badly I needed tonight. There's a little bit of silence, and then Judy tells Michelle, I have cancer. But when she looks over, Michelle is dead asleep. So for the time being, she's still the only one who knows. The good news is everybody in the show is finally getting laid, so that's a positive. In episode 5, both Judy and Jen wake up next to the person they slept to, and everybody seems like they had a really good time. Michelle has to run. Her mom has a cardiologist appointment, and Judy tells her, if you ever need anything, you know where I live. Ben's pillow talk is a little bit different. It starts off good, but then he brings up Steve, and it gets a little bit awkward. Jen tells him all about the grief group that she went to, and she didn't like it at first, but it did seem to help, and she suggests that maybe he check it out. Ben then gets up to take a bath, which, yes, is a little weird, and Charlie walks in. So Charlie knows what went down last night. He finds it very amusing. But the reason he barged right in is because there's a leak in their ceiling. It seems to be right above the tub. Ben offers to go take a look, see if he can figure it out. And he asks Charlie if he can help out. He wanted to get Charlie alone privately so he could apologize for the other day. Showing up absolutely blitzed. Charlie tells him that he still hasn't told anybody, including his mom. And Ben really appreciates that. He says, you know, I'm, I'm not that guy. Charlie completely gets it because he did some messed up things after his dad died, so all's forgiven. As for the whole issue with the pipes, Ben's never seen anything like it. There's a huge hole in one of the pipes, like something just corroded and burned right through it. Probably was that dead rat that Jen decided to drop in there and burn. Unfortunately, it's above Ben's pay grade. He can't fix it, so they're going to have to get a professional. While all of this is happening, Judy has an appointment with her doctor. Her doctor explains the rounds of chemo, what she could expect. It's all pretty depressing stuff. As soon as she gets back to Jen's, Jen asks her, where have you been? I'm freaking out. Turns out Ben was the one that hit us. Oh, and we slept together, which was good, but it's also bad because he's upstairs trying to fix the leak in our pipes. Judy blurts out, maybe this isn't the best time to tell you what I was good to tell you. And right away, Jen says, well, what were you to tell me? Judy was good to tell her about the cancer diagnosis, but... Instead, she says, I have to go up to Sonoma with Michelle for three months. She's opening up a winery and a restaurant. She wants me to spruce it up. Jen's a little confused about that because, after all, Michelle and Judy dated for all of, like, a week. But Judy just runs with this lie and makes it a little bit believable. Ben then comes downstairs and sees Judy and asks Jen, did you tell her? Jen confirms that she did, and Ben gets super emotional, apologizing to Judy the same way he did to Jen, without the hooking up part. Ben is clearly not doing great. So Judy and Jen decided to take him to one of those grief groups, and boy, does he let it out. After Ben shares a little bit with the group, Yolanda explains that it's a special day for her because it's the 20th anniversary of Bert's death. She usually goes to their favorite karaoke bar to celebrate his life, but unfortunately that closed. So she doesn't really have any plans, but Judy's not going to let her spend this day alone. She asks Jen, doesn't Henry have that karaoke machine? And in fact, he does. So the entire grief group is coming over that night to enjoy some karaoke and celebrate the life of Bert. This isn't exactly something that Jen really wants to do. She just currently has a lot on her plate. And this includes the FBI. But Judy tells her, don't worry about that. I talked to Glenn. I was able to imply that the Greeks were involved in our hit and run, which implies that they were the one that killed Steve because he was stealing money from them after all. Jen doesn't see this as being a good thing, though. She could see this backfiring and Moranis looking more at them than he previously was planning on. But what it really boils down to is Jen is pissed off that Judy is just leaving for three months. A couple hours later, everybody shows up and everybody's enjoying karaoke, especially Yolanda. Yolanda, though, gets so emotional after she sings that she just needs a moment to herself. Judy sees what happens, so she goes and grabs her a glass of water. 
They start talking about Burt, the guy he was, how ordinary he was, but how perfect he was for Yolanda. Yolanda is still really hurt about the fact that Burt took his own life and never asked for help. Right before she heads out, she really thanks Judy for setting all of this up. She truly appreciates it. Henry, though, interrupts the conversation by opening the door and telling Judy that her friend is here. Michelle has shown up, completely out of the blue. When Jen sees her, she says, oh, I heard about Sonoma, very confrontationally. But Judy steps in and just tries to stop that because, of course, Michelle has no idea about this proposed trip. Michelle and Judy then go off and talk in private. Michelle apologized for just showing up like this, but she wanted to apologize. Something has been really eating at her. She heard what Judy said in bed the other night. She pretended to be asleep, and the fact that she pretended to be asleep with such a big reveal, she just feels like a real shitty person for doing that. Judy tries to tell her that it's fine, it's okay, but Michelle says, no, it's not okay. You don't have to talk about it, but if you need somebody, I'm here. Judy tells Michelle that she'll be okay. She's got Jen. And Michelle tells her, well, if there's anything I can do for you, just let me know. And Judy says, yeah, you can invite me to Sonoma when you open up your new restaurant. It's interesting she brought it up because Michelle actually talked to her mom that day about that very topic. And her mom was really supportive about it. Michelle wasn't the only one to make an impromptu visit, though. So did Ben. And unfortunately, he's blitzed again. As Judy is talking to Michelle, Jen is asking Ben, what are you doing here? And the reason why Ben is so blitzed is because they talked to the FBI and they found out that Steve drowned. And it's really awkward because Ben is telling her this right in front of the pool that Steve died in. It gets even worse when Ben drops the bottle of wine he was drinking into the pool and then falls in. It was a bottle of red, so it brings back a lot of flashbacks to the night that Steve actually died. It takes a little bit, but both Judy and Jen are able to get Ben out of the pool and into the house. They sit him down and go get him some towels and whatnot, and Charlie comes in and sees a drunk Ben sitting in his kitchen counter, and he starts screaming at him, saying, I thought you weren't that guy. You need to own up to your stuff and stay away from my mom. This dose of reality from Charlie does hit home with Ben. He knows he needs to do something. So he goes to Nick, and he asks for help. And Nick gets him checked into a rehab facility. As they're actually walking out to go get Ben some help, Nick says, hey, by the way, if you don't mind me asking, where did you get that bird? And Ben tells him it was Henry, Jen's son. Judy made it for him. And Nick finds that very interesting. Back at Jen's, both her and Judy start talking, and Jen fills Judy in on the fact that Steve drowned, and she starts beating herself up all over again for being a terrible person, for even keeping Ben around even after she killed his brother. So Judy decides to change the conversation by telling Jen that she has cancer. She explains everything. And Jen is pissed off, but not so much at Judy, more about the news that she just got. Jen assures her that she will be there for her during this time. No matter what she needs, Jen will be there. The next day, Jen proves how dedicated she is to all this by making a detailed schedule of all of Judy's doctor's appointments. But as they're discussing this and Henry and Shandy are walking in, the leak finally gives way. The tub crashes through the ceiling and now it's on the first floor. So Jen has that to deal with. In episode 6, Judy's about to go in for her first treatment and it's got Jen completely on edge. She sits both Charlie and Henry down and tells them both, I need your help on this. This is an all-hands-on-deck situation, so I need you to step up with her in treatment. As if she didn't have enough stuff on her plate, Henry hands her a bunch of papers and says, Are you still going to help me make my cranes for Christ? Jen now has to make a thousand paper cranes. Henry's big concern, though, is Judy. He asks his mom, Is she going to be okay? And his mom says, Yeah, we're doing all the right things. She should be okay. She then gets in the car and drives Judy to her first treatment. Judy's in pretty good spirits, as expected. She's also trying a bunch of alternative medicines because, hey, why not? But Judy gets really upset when she mentions how after the chemo, she's probably going to go into menopause, which means she's never going to have a kid. And Jen tries to make her feel better by saying, well, you know, I'm going through menopause right now, so I'll be right there with you. But it doesn't really make Judy feel any better. They get to the hospital, they strap Judy in the chair, and she gets ready to do this thing. It's going to be weeks of this. Chemo, feeling crappy, but Jen has plans to be there the entire time. And to repay her, Judy has plans to help Jen out with making those paper cranes. After her first round of chemo, she is, in fact, feeling pretty crappy. She's staying in Charlie's room for the time being, and Charlie brings her some tea. 
They start making a little bit of small talk, and then Charlie notices all of the medicine that she has to take. One has definitely caught his eye. It's the gummies. Judy tells him, I'm not going to really notice if a few go missing. But even though Judy is trying to put on a strong face, she feels like crap. Days turn into weeks. Weeks turn into a couple months. And next thing you know, Judy has finished a 1,000 paper cranes and chemotherapy. During all of the chemotherapy, Detective Perez has been trying to get in touch with Jen, though. That's because Nick has been able to figure out where that piece of wood came from. He showed up at Detective Perez's desk and dumped a bunch of wooden birds on the table. Detective Perez tried to brush it off and said that she didn't see the similarities, but clearly Nick is on to something. In order to kind of get him off the scent, she tells him that she'll be the one to take all of this information to Detective Moranis. But in the meantime, he's supposed to focus on finding the driver of the hit and run. Way easier said than done. I mean, Nick is just sitting at a computer looking at security cam footage over and over and over again. All that hard work pays off, though, because he does find something interesting. It looks like the hit-and-run vehicle, and Charlie was the one who was driving it. Back over with Perez, though, she finally is able to get in touch with Jen, and when they meet up, she is not happy. She feels like Jen's been blowing her off. She just isn't aware of the current situation. She shows it to Jen and says, you know, I'm supposed to give this to the FBI. Apparently a little gal pal is running around handing out birds. I mean, I didn't, but that doesn't mean they're not going to figure it out on their own. If Nick can figure it out, they will. Jen starts crying, telling Perez, I don't care if they figure it out. Let them figure it out. And as Perez is ripping into her, finally Jen says, Judy has cervical cancer. Jen starts just bearing her soul to Perez about how scared she is that she's going to lose Judy. And how all of this has been bottled up because she can't let Judy see her like this. Instead of saying anything... Detective Perez just sits in the car and listens. When she gets out of the car, she goes, she picks up Judy, and she takes her home because Judy just finished three months of chemo. It's quite an accomplishment, and it's one that Jen wants to celebrate, but Judy can't because her nurse ended up dying of a heart attack, so she's pretty emotional. No matter how much Jen tries to cheer up Judy, Judy just isn't really willing to be cheery. So Jen tries an alternative method. Judy had all of those different kinds of medicines, and that included mushrooms. So Jen takes some. She convinces Judy to take some. And a little while later, they're both tripping balls. These two are having a great time. Well, when Jen goes to the bathroom, Judy gives her some advice. Whatever you do, don't look in the mirror. And Jen doesn't follow it. And when she looks in the mirror, she sees her mom, who died of cancer, staring back at her. It freaks her out so much that she comes out of the bathroom and says to Judy... You gotta take me to the hospital. I'm having a heart attack. Of course, Judy can't take her to the hospital. She's also on shrooms. So that leaves Charlie to take her to the hospital. And Charlie's reveling in the fact that he has to take his adult mother to the hospital because she's the one on drugs. As Charlie and Jen head to the hospital, Judy has to watch Henry. She doesn't come right out and say to Henry, hey, your mom's going to the hospital because she's tripping balls. She just tells him that his mom has to go out for a bit. And that's the reason why she's the one doing the tuck-in for the night. She then gives him the thousand paper cranes that she made him. And it's something that Henry really, really appreciates. He knew his mom didn't want to do it and probably wouldn't have done it. So the fact that they got done is something that he wasn't really expecting. She asks him, what are you going to do with all these? And he says, well, I'm supposed to make a wish. He's supposed to wish for Christ's return, but he wants to use the wish on Judy to make sure that she's okay. And that's because Judy's like his second mom. She is really, really touched by this comment. But his actual mom is getting some interesting news. She's checked in the hospital and she's not having a heart attack. But she is pregnant. Four months pregnant. In episode 7, Judy has a new lease on life. She feels great after three months of feeling crappy. She's done with chemo and she feels amazing. She heads to the doctors where she's painted her a picture as a thank you gift. But she gets a little bit of bad news. The doctor tells her that this is only the first round of chemo. They're going to go and do a scan and see if she reacted to the chemo. And if she did, great. She doesn't have to go through a second round. But odds are she's going to have to go through a second round of chemo. Most people do. And Judy just wasn't expecting that. She thought this would be a three-month stretch and then that's it. She's cured. And now she's learning that she'll probably have to go in for another three months. Being sick for three more months isn't really appealing to Judy at all. It's also not that appealing to Jen. She goes and has a doctor's visit, and she just can't understand how in the world she's pregnant. Sure, she felt things, but she just figured it was the menopause. And the doctor lets her know that, yeah, she is going through menopause, but that doesn't mean she still can't get pregnant. 
The good news is the baby looks healthy, but right now Jen doesn't want to hear anything about a baby. All she wants to do is go back in time and not have sex with Ben. For the time being, she's planning on keeping it a secret, so much so that she stops off and gets a hideous-looking poncho to wear to cover up her little bit of a baby bump that she's already sporting. When she gets home, Judy has made her a thank you gift for helping her get through chemo. It's a wine flight. Of course, Jen can't drink wine, she's pregnant, and she also doesn't want to tell Judy about it. And the fact that Jen doesn't want to drink, Judy thinks that it's because Jen is not drinking in solidarity of Ben being in rehab. But Jen says, no, it has nothing to do with that. I just want to focus on my health right now. She's a really bad liar. They then start talking about what they're doing that day, and Jen has to get ready to show a house. It's actually for her neighbor, Karen. Jeff and Karen have split up, and while Jeff is taking it in stride, Karen is not. You hate to see a young romance die so quickly, but they're selling the house. Jen is in charge of showing it. And all the while, the only thing Jen could think of is this baby that she doesn't want to have and the fact that she's worried people are going to figure out that she's pregnant. After all, who's rocking a poncho in Laguna Beach? It's actually more impressive she even found a poncho, but I digress. As if her day can't get bad enough, Jen gets a little bout of nausea and she steps out of the house to just puke in a bush. And there's Ben standing there looking at her. He's fresh out of rehab and he's ready to do his reconciliation of the 12-step program. Even though both Judy and Jen tell him that it's not even worth doing that, it's fine, everything's forgiven, he still feels like he needs to apologize. He then lets him know that he's planning on moving back up north. He's got to get back to that life. He's now realizing there was a reason he left Laguna in the first place. There's just a lot of bad memories. This would be a good time for Jen to pull him aside and tell him that he's going to be a dad, again, because he already has a son in college, but... She doesn't do that. They just tell him that they're really going to miss him. Judy asks Ben, are you sure that you really have to go? And he tells them, I'd only be staying out of obligation to my parents. So there's not really any other like reason to stay. Ben was probably trying to fish around for Jen to say something, convince him to stay, but she doesn't. She stays quiet. And once Ben leaves, Judy yells at her for that, saying he was clearly trying to get you to say something, but you didn't. You were supposed to be the one to convince him to stay, but you just stayed quiet. Jen tries to act like there's nothing going on between the two, but Judy reminds her that Jen did say his name twice when she was tripping. She also had sex with him twice, so there's definitely something going on. They get in an argument about whether or not Jen loves him. Jen saying she doesn't, and Judy saying, I I just don't believe you. Jen tells Judy, I can't even look at him. I killed his brother. Judy reminds Jen that his brother killed her husband, but Jen says, yeah, he doesn't know that. And Judy says, well, maybe he should. What if we just told him the truth about everything? Don't you think he could forgive you? And Jen does not think that Ben will forgive her. Judy starts reminding Jen about how they told each other the truth. And yeah, they went through a rough patch, but it worked out because that's what friends do. Jen thinks about it and agrees with it. So she tells Judy how she's pregnant. This comes as quite a surprise, especially when she starts putting the puzzle pieces together and realizes that it's Ben's child. Judy tries to spin this in a normal, positive way, but she struggles to do that. It's obvious that Judy is upset and hurt. She knows that now she'll never have a child, and here's a woman that she's friends with who's also going through menopause, and she happens to be pregnant, and she doesn't want it. It's just tough for Judy to swallow that pill. Judy excuses herself because she needs a minute. And a little bit later, Jen gets a text from Perez that they need to meet. Nick showed Perez what he found, the picture of Charlie driving what he thinks is the hit-and-run vehicle. Perez tries to dispel this theory, saying it really doesn't make sense. Why would he try to hurt his own mother? But the way Nick pieced it together, maybe the target wasn't his mother. Maybe it was Judy Hale because Judy was in the car that killed his father. It was retribution. And if you look at what happened with Steve Wood, it might have been Charlie all along. Even though Perez continues to dispel the theory, the way that Nick looks at it, Charlie had motive, and now he had opportunity to do it. He then asks Perez if she ever heard back from Agent Moranis about the wooden bird, but she says, no, never did. And Nick finds that super weird. He suggests that maybe he go follow up, but Perez says, no, don't. We should just bring Charlie in. She doesn't want Nick to go with, though. She wants to talk to Jen alone, so she tasks Nick with isolating the plates on the footage. She then met up with Jen and shows Jen the picture of Charlie, and Jen tells her emphatically, Charlie did not hit us. Perez, though, isn't so convinced. I mean, the evidence is pretty clear. But when Perez threatens to pull Charlie downtown and press charges against him, 
Jen finally comes clean that it was Ben, but says she's not pressing charges, no harm, no foul, and he's sorry about it, so just let him go. Through Jen's explanation on why they shouldn't arrest Ben, Perez is able to discern that Ben must have been drinking. So drinking and driving, yeah, she's got to do something about that. Jen begs Perez not to do anything about it, but Perez screams, I can't. I'm not your sorority sister, I'm a cop. Perez then starts trying to convince Jen on why she should press charges, and Jen blurts out, it's because I'm pregnant. That does change things quite a bit. When Jen leaves Perez's car, she goes to check on Judy, and she apologizes for everything. It's not like Jen went out and got pregnant on purpose, but she still feels bad for her friend. And Judy says, don't apologize. They start talking about the pregnancy, and Jen's really concerned because she feels like she can't do it alone. She tells Judy, if you want to repay me for helping you through chemo, help me through this. I can't tell Ben. It just wouldn't be fair. Judy tells her, you know, Ben deserves to know all of it, and then maybe he can process it. Maybe that can lead to you guys having a life together. But Jen already has a life, and she's comfortable. They then kind of go their separate ways and go do their own thing, and later that night, as Jen is hanging out with the boys, Judy walks in. She tells Jen that she's thought of a better way to repay her. Because odds are, she's not going to be there to help her out throughout this whole process. After all, she does have stage 4 cancer. So she went over to Ben's place and convinced him to stay. Judy didn't tell Ben that he's going to be a father, but Ben was keeping a secret. He tells Jen that the night that Ted died, he had something to do with it. He was involved. Because they were driving him home. He was drunk and he was in the back seat when they hit Ted. Deep down, Ben takes full responsibility for the death of Ted. If he wasn't drunk and they didn't drive him home, Ted is still alive. Ben came over because he doesn't want any secrets between them, and Jen agrees. She's about to tell Ben about the fact that he's going to be a father, but that's when Perez and Nick show up and arrest him. It gives Nick no pleasure that he has to do this. He looks at Ben as a friend, but he has to arrest him. Perez didn't want to do this, but Nick kind of made an impassioned speech about how he was being sidelined by Perez, and he didn't appreciate it. He looked at it like Perez thought he was a bad cop. So Perez ended up giving him a little bit of insight, and that insight was that Ben was the one who was driving that day. Perez apologizes to Jen, and then they take Ben in. In episode 8, Jen heads down to the police precinct and wants to have a conversation with Perez about getting Ben freed. She thought they had an understanding after they talked in the car privately, but apparently not, and she's not happy about it. She tries to blackmail Detective Perez because, after all, Perez knows what happened to Steve Wood, But that doesn't go all that well either. Perez pulls Jen outside to have a bit of a more private conversation and explains to her that she shouldn't be barging in there making veiled threats. Perez tells Jen that Ben isn't going to do all this hard time that she thinks he is. After all, he's a white male in Laguna for a DUI hit and run. But she also tells her that Ben should be the least of her concern because they found DNA on Steve's body. And while they don't know whose DNA it is, It's not going to take long for Jen's DNA to probably show up. Jen asks Perez, what do we do? And Perez says, there's no more we. Not anymore. You're on your own with this. And gets up and walks away. When Jen gets home, she fills Judy in on exactly what Perez told her. And they start trying to talk this out. Figure out what they can do. One of the things she thought of is just turning herself in. Thinking that maybe if she just owned up to it, she would get some leniency. But Judy says, yeah, I don't think it works like that. And now Jen's worried that she could have a nervous breakdown. Judy's suggestion is just to stay calm. After all, they don't know what they found, and the FBI could have nothing. But the way that Jen looks at it, yeah, they could have something, though. And then what? Jen really wants to get a lawyer, and Judy's suggestion is just to go on vacation. Jen thinks that's crazy, just running away. Especially considering that Judy has to go back for her scans. Judy, however, says that she can just do that next week. The reality of the situation is the oncologist has called multiple times to schedule the scans and Judy has just sent them straight to voicemail. She doesn't really have any interest in doing the scans. But Judy is pretty dead set on this whole vacation plan. She tells Jen that Steve has a place in Mexico and they can just go there. This does sound like a nice idea and Jen starts thinking that maybe a little bit of a vacation could do them both some good. She then has to get ready because she's showing Karen's open house that day. The open house doesn't go as expected because Karen actually shows up and she's really emotional. But one person who shows up at the open house is Agent Moranis. He didn't show up because he's looking for a house. He showed up to talk to Jen. 
Jen tells Moranis to just wait until after the open house, and then they can head on over to her place and have this conversation. And they walk in to find Judy, whose bags are already packed. And Judy's as surprised to see Moranis as Jen was, although Judy is way better at playing it off. He just has some simple questions like, what was the relationship with Steve Wood? Because, after all, she was his real estate agent for a little bit. He also has questions as to how much money the condos went for. It seems like he's starting to buy into the whole Greek mafia having an influence on everything. But he also wants to know why she had a parking ticket for just outside the very park where they found Steve's body. And it's Judy who walks in and saves the day by saying they were up there for a girls weekend. And it wasn't just them, it was with their buddy Jeff. As Moranis is sucking down a scone, he seems to buy the whole story. But once he leaves, Jen is freaking out a little bit. I mean, they did say that they had a girls weekend with Jeff and Jeff wasn't there and Jeff doesn't know anything about it. She then starts freaking out even more when she can't find the mug that she was drinking. She starts getting so convinced that Moranis took it as evidence, looking to get her DNA and her fingerprints. They start thinking about what they're going to do about this, and as Judy says, we check the dining room, Jen says at the same time, we kill Glenn. They can make it look like an accident. They just take those pills that Judy stole from the hospital, they crush a bunch of them up, and they put them in a scones recipe and feed it to them. All of it will look like an overdose. But as Jen is figuring out this master crime, Judy finds the mug. So, no reason to kill Glenn. They then have to go make sure Jeff is on board with this whole corroboration. Lucky for them, Jeff has a terrible memory. He's lied so much that he just has trouble keeping his story straight. So when they feed him the story about going up for this girls weekend, he believes it all. In fact, they even spin it so that he thinks they're doing him a favor with the FBI. That if the FBI comes calling the girls will be the one having his back, not the other way around. Right before they leave, Jeff does tell Jen that even though she asked him to delete that footage from the cloud, he actually never did. He's been meaning to tell her, but it just slipped his mind, and now he just remembered. Karen reset the cloud password, so he never got a chance to do it. So that footage still exists, which is another thing they have to deal with. They're going to have to figure out a way to delete it. That night, they do so by heading over to Karen's and trying to be a, quote, friend to her, in this time of mourning. She's still pretty hung up on Jeff. She really just sits in her safe room looking at old photos of him. So the girls convince her to delete the entire cloud for the past year. Just get rid of it all. She needs to move on with her life, but she doesn't know that by deleting everything, she's actually deleting that video that they want gone. They convince Karen to do it, they get her external hard drive, and then they finally head home. The next day, Judy finally decides to call the hospital and schedule her scan. As she's doing that in the other room, Jen is trying to sign her up for a clinical trial. In the middle of it, though, the doorbell rings, and it's Karen. She tells Jen that she found something disturbing on her camera. Right away, Jen thinks that it's going to be her, but it's not. It's actually Moranis. He was going through Jen's trash. He grabbed the bag that she threw out that night, the bag of the ashes, and he took it with him. Karen doesn't know that Moranis actually is an FBI agent. She just thinks that he's a creep who was looking at her house. But Jen now knows the severity of the situation. She knows it's only a matter of time before Moranis connects the dots, and she has to do something about it. So the next day, she shows up at Moranis' hotel room, and she's got a whole mess of scones for him. In episode 9, Jen sits down with Moranis, and as he's eating those scones, she tells him a story that she had an affair with Steve Wood. This covers her tracks a little bit, that if they find DNA on Steve and it's hers, it would explain a lot. She says that she didn't say this before because she didn't want Judy finding out. Moranis seems to buy it all, and he also really appreciates the scones. But when Jen leaves the room, Moranis is still very much alive. Jen leaves the hotel room, gets in her car, and as she's leaving, she sees these two guys in suits that smile at her, and they seem to be heading to Moranis' hotel room. She doesn't really think anything of it. She thinks that they might be just FBI, and she just goes about her business. When she gets home, she meets with Judy, and she doesn't say a word about meeting with Moranis, but she doesn't really have a chance to. Judy tells her that she got the scans, and unfortunately, she's terminal. Jen starts talking about how there got to be another option, but Judy stops her and says, No. We always knew that the odds of the chemo working were always pretty low. It's okay. Really. I've accepted it. But Jen has not. She's not ready to give up on her friend just giving up and dying. She's now hell-bent on getting her friend into this clinical trial. Judy doesn't really have any interest in doing it, though. She already went through chemo, and that was hard. Clinical trial is going to be even harder. And if she's going to die, she doesn't want to spend the remaining time she has miserable sick. She wants to spend it happy. Jen, though, still is not ready to give up on her friend dying. 
Jen then tells Judy about what Karen showed her the previous night. Moran is scooping up her DNA. She also tells Judy not to worry about it because stress isn't good for the cancer. And Judy says, well, stress isn't good for the baby either. But they were both unaware that Charlie and Henry were walking in the room, and they heard that line. And it takes all of about five seconds for Charlie to realize that his mom is knocked up. After the initial shock of her children learning that she's four or five months pregnant, she goes to work, calling up the hospital and trying to get Judy into this clinical trial, but it's not working, and her bedside manner is worse than most doctors. She then gets a phone call from prison, and it's Ben. They make a little chit-chat about how he's holding up, but at no point does she tell him about the baby. As Jen is getting caught back up with Ben, Judy goes to visit her mother, who is actually out of prison, believe it or not. She wants to be able to say goodbye to her mother, but she also doesn't want to tell her mother that she has cancer. After a bit of small talk back and forth, she gives her mother an envelope with a bunch of cash in it and tells her that she's going away for a little bit. When her mom asks her, where are you going? She tells her, Sonoma, I'm helping a friend open up a restaurant. Judy then heads home and she starts rummaging through the guest house. Now, normally the guest house is where she is staying, but in this situation, she's taking over Charlie's room and Charlie's taking over the guest house. She starts looking through the safe and looking for the gun And Charlie catches her. He thinks that she's just rummaging through his stuff and he gets upset and even says, doesn't anyone in this family have any boundaries? But all that Judy heard was anyone in this family. And she likes the fact that Charlie thinks that she is a part of the family. He sits down and confides in her that he can't quite figure out his mom. She hated his dad, but she likes Ben. Judy tries to explain to Charlie that Jen is the kind of mother that he actually wants. And she would know firsthand having a pretty bad mom herself. At the end of this conversation, Judy gives him a hug and says, I love you. And Charlie says, I love you too. And that means so much to Judy. As Judy and Charlie are having a little bit of a heart to heart, Jen is dropping off the thousand paper cranes that Judy made for the Holy Harmony show. The mother that Jen drops it off to can't believe that Jen made it. And Jen admits, yeah, I didn't make it. My friend did when she was going through chemo. It turns out that this mom is a doctor, and she knows people over at the hospital that's doing that clinical trial. She's going to make some phone calls and see if she can get Judy in. She's really excited about the possibility of getting Judy in. She calls Judy up when she gets home, but Judy doesn't answer. There's then a knock at the door, and Jen just figures that it's Judy, but it's not. It's Judy's mom. When Judy's mom opened up the package that Judy gave her and she saw all that money, she thought that something was up, that Judy was once again into some shady stuff, So she came looking for her. Judy's not there, so she sits down and she starts ripping Judy to Jen. Finally, Jen gets sick of it and tells Judy's mom, your daughter has cancer. Judy's mom takes a little bit to process this, asks Jen if she's going to be okay, but by Jen's face, she knows the answer's probably not. Now, Jen was busy picking up Henry, but when Henry walks in the door, he says, yeah, Judy's not with me. She had a bag packed and she just dropped me off and left. Jen immediately calls Judy's phone, but Judy left it behind. She also left a beautiful painting that she made. But Judy didn't go down to Mexico. She went to turn herself in. She tells Nick that it was her who was the one who killed Steve Wood. She figures that with terminal cancer, what does it even matter? She'll take the hit. It'll save Jen and her family. And it is one hell of a story, but Nick has to believe it because she just confessed to murder. Nick asks her, why didn't you just go to the FBI and try to strike a plea? And Judy tells him, I felt like it'd be better if I just told a friend. The good news is Judy does get one phone call and she uses it to call up Jen. But when Jen gets to the precinct, she's pissed off. She can't believe that Judy did this. After all, they're in this thing together. She starts trying to convince Judy to go back on the word, but Judy says, no, I'm not going to do it. And it gets Jen even more upset. This sparks a pretty heated argument between the two. It goes from screaming to crying to pleading. And when Jen walks out, she's not willing to give up. She goes and talks to Nick, begging him to just arrest her in three weeks. Let her go through this clinical trial. And even though Nick likes Judy, he can't just let her go. But Jen is really convincing. And at the end of their conversation, Judy is able to go home, but with an ankle monitor. And three weeks after the clinical trial, she'll be arrested for murder. When they get back to Jen's house, Judy's mom is still there. And Judy's pretty surprised to see her. Judy's mom never tells Judy that she knows about the cancer. She words it as saying, I just wanted to give you a proper goodbye before you head off to Sonoma. Back at the police precinct, though, Nick comes clean to Perez, telling her what he did with Judy and explaining that he's probably going to have to resign, but if that makes him a bad person, then so be it. 
Perez, though, isn't asking for his resignation. But even with her not demanding it, he knows that his career is over if Moranis ever finds out. And that's when Perez says Moranis is never going to find out. Because Perez went to the motel that day, and what she found was a very dead Moranis and a ransacked room. They don't have any leads on who killed Moranis, how he died, who went through the room, but they no longer have to worry about him. And as for the FBI folder, Perez took that with her and decided to burn it. The next day, Judy and Jen should be heading to that clinical trial, but they don't. There's no plans on going to the clinical trial. They're going to have that vacation in Mexico, and they head over the border. And in the series finale, they cross over the border, and they immediately start talking about all their regrets, the things that they didn't do. It's not like they're removed from reality, though. They know that they have three weeks down in Mexico. Then you've got a likely scenario of Judy heading to prison. But that's something that right now Jen just doesn't want to think about. They pull over because they have to go to the bathroom, though. As Jen is standing watch for Judy, they notice that another car is pulled up, and Jen recognizes the two guys. It's the same two guys that were walking towards Agent Moranis' hotel room. She figures they're FBI, but Judy says, no, they're not FBI, they're the Greeks. That's because Judy knows them. They've been tailing both of them for quite some time. They want the money that Steve stole. They've been able to figure out that if Steve stole the money from them, Judy must have stolen it from him. Judy, though, plays the cancer card, letting him know that she's got the big C, which does make them very sympathetic to her cause, but also letting him know that Jen is pregnant. So you've got a terminal woman and a pregnant woman, killing both not great optics. She then fakes a bout of nausea and begs them, just let me get my medicine. And when they do that, she pulls out the gun from the safe. She demands that they get back in the car. She shoots their tires out, and then Jen and Judy head off. A little while later, they arrive at Steve's Mexican cabin. There's nobody there, but they do find a house cat. They then start living their best life. Walking the beach, watching Mexican television, which is really just American reruns with bad dubs. But one morning, Jen wakes up and she panics because Judy's nowhere. When she finally finds Judy, Judy tells her that she just took the boat out on the water because the sunrise was beautiful. And Jen says, well, next time, can you just leave a note? I was freaking out. Judy then starts trying to convince Jen to go out on the water with her. And Jen definitely has no interest in doing that. She doesn't think it's safe. And Judy says, well, there are life vests in the garage. But when they go to the garage, what they find is a car. And it looks like it's the same exact car that hit Ted. Both women are very confused, but Judy figures that Steve must have gotten all the parts and put it back together. It's an extremely awkward situation for both of them. Judy offers Jen a golf club if she wants to smash it up because she must hate the thing, but Jen... Holding back tears says, how can I hate it? It brought me you. After a little bit of a hug, they head down to the water, and they never actually go in, but they do sit on a boat on the beach. That was the compromise they came to. Judy tells Jen all about her Uncle Paul, which really was just one of her mom's boyfriends. He's the one who taught her how to sail. One day, he sailed out of their life. Paul and Judy's mom got into a fight, and she never saw him again. He's always wondered how he's doing, and if he thinks of her. She also always wondered if Paul was actually her real dad. Reality then hits both women because they only have a few days left, but Jen has come up with a plan. What if Judy died? I mean, she's going to die, but what if they tell the police that she died in the clinical trial? And then they both just stay there, in Mexico. Admittedly, Jen has not worked out all of the details for this, i.e. like getting Charlie and Henry down there, relocating the whole family, having the baby in Mexico. She's really just spitballing, but Judy tells her you can't do any of that. Jen wants to be with Judy the entire time, but Judy, crying at this point, says, No, I'm not going to be like your mother. I'm not going to let you see me suffer and put you through that. No. Judy does turn to Jen and say, You have to promise me, though, that you will not let that baby grow up without knowing who its father is. Trust me on this. As for the baby, though, they have a bigger issue than the baby's father. Jen starts bleeding. They have to rush to a Mexican hospital, and luckily, it turns out Judy speaks fluent Spanish. And that doctor tells Judy to tell Jen that she just has a condition, and the baby is healthy, and everything looks great. They'll have to do a couple follow-up visits, but while this is scary, it's nothing to be really alarmed about. They also learn that Jen is having a girl, which Jen is thrilled about. That's what she was hoping for. 
With only a few days left in Mexico, they decide to go out and have an authentic Mexican dinner that night. While Judy is sucking down a margarita, Jen is sucking down water in a margarita glass. Even with no alcohol, they seem to be having a great time dancing in the mariachi band. But in the middle of it, Jen gets a phone call from Ben. During this phone call, Jen finally decides to tell Ben that she's pregnant and the baby is his. He is beyond excited about this. He's thrilled. Ben didn't call, though, just to catch up with Jen. He called because he had some news. He found out that Agent Moran has died. This is great news for Judy and Jen because the FBI thinks that the Greeks did it. They also think that the Greeks killed Steve as well. Because in Moranis' room, it was completely ransacked and the file on Steve was missing. The point is, both women can go back and be fine. Judy reminds Jen, though, about that whole confession thing, but Jen thinks there's got to be a way around that. You just say you made it up or the Greeks threaten to kill you, something. But Judy's health is rapidly deteriorating. She's just been really, really good at hiding it. Once Jen gets Judy in bed, she says, look, I don't want you to suffer. We'll figure this out once we get back. And that's when Judy has to tell Jen... I'm not going back. This is really, really tough for Jen to hear, but they start making plans to visit each other, see each other on weekends. As hard as it is for Jen to hear that her friend isn't coming back with her, she does understand it because the house is beautiful. They then start crying, telling each other how much they mean to each other, and then finally telling each other that they love each other. When Jen wakes up the next morning, Judy isn't there, but there is a note. Judy took the boat in the early, early hours of the day, and she sailed off. Now, the only thing left for Jen to do is head back. She decides to do so in Steve's car, the same car that killed Ted. The whole time on the drive, she's talking to Judy, even though Judy isn't there with her. But she's there in spirit. It's not like Jen is going back by herself, though. She decided to bring the cat. She gets back to Laguna just in enough time to go see Henry's concert. And when she enters the church, the thousand paper cranes that Judy made are strewn from the ceiling. So she gets even more emotional. The music choice is also interesting. The kids are singing Come On, Get Happy, a song all about death. That doesn't help things. She makes her way slowly down the aisle until she finds Lorna along with Charlie. Both Lorna and Charlie know what happened to Judy. They know that she's gone. They also know that Jen is very fragile at the moment. But then somebody comes and sits right down next to her, and it's Ben. He got out for good behavior. Judy sent him a flyer for the concert, so he knew where to find Jen. But when he asks Jen, is Judy here? Jen just looks up at all the paper cranes and says, yep, and then starts crying. Jen is now going to the grief group for a whole nother reason. Not her husband, but her friend. The good news is she gave birth to a beautiful, healthy baby girl. But no, she didn't name it Judy. I thought that too. She named it Joey. She thought naming it Judy would be weird. She's continued to live her life at her house. Ben has moved in. He's getting along great with the kids. Everything seems to be going great for Jen. But something has been bothering her. The fact that she never told Ben what happened to his brother. So she turns to Ben and says, I have something to tell you. And that is how Dead to Me ends. Thank you so much for watching this recap. If you watch the other ones, I really appreciate that too. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down if you thought it sucked. I have a Patreon. I have merch. I have a membership. I have a bunch of ways that lead to you giving me money. But I do appreciate that. And normally I say I'll talk to you next season. But in this case, I won't.